I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Uh, Professor uh, George Mason, who will introduce our speaker. Over to you, George. Okay. Um, Dr. Ali uh, Balling is, is a Department of Mechanical and Production Engineer at that department, which is a, a section of the mechatronics and dynamics of Arias uh, University in Denmark. His work with the NATO working group and the verification and validation of next generation NRMM has been essential in determining and validating the model. He has worked in Estonia and some other areas to put together the soil testing and the vehicle testing and to take the data and go back and look at the model itself. So the information he provides here as part of that program will be essential in understanding the model itself. I worked on the legacy model, so that's NRMM itself. So I'm very interested in this talk and I believe uh, without any further ado, we should I should turn it over to Dr. Balling and his remarkable presentation. Dr. Balling, it's your, it's your court. <laughs> Professor. All right, I was uh, muted. So first, first sign of true uh, professorship. <laughs> so let me share my uh, screen here. Um, so you see this. Okay, so, all right, if you see the screen, I see a thumbs up. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be uh, introduced by such great uh, people here and to, to be uh, um, invited to uh, give a talk on some of our work. Uh, the title here is Next Generation NATO Reference Mobility Model. Uh, I will also uh, show a little bit uh, on our motivation into this, where we started, uh, and I will say that there is a lot more that I could show that I cannot, uh, that I had not um, been able to comp uh, compact into this uh, slide deck today. So maybe I can come back another time and talk more specific specific events. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, basically, I'll give you a card, a short uh, introduction here to the agenda. So I'll talk a little bit about our background and how we got involved with this. Uh, uh, next generation NATO reference mobility model. I'll talk a little bit about what NGNRMM is uh, and why we have been uh, spending so many hours of our uh, awake life uh, on this. Uh, a little bit about what does it mean to uh, adhere to this uh, recommendation. And uh, basically through the work I'll plan today, I hope you get an understanding of the efforts going into um, uh, giving you confidence in your models uh, by using this recommendation. So NG and RMM is really just a recommendation of modeling and simulation and how you should validate for off-road mobility. Then a little bit specifics on some, uh, some frustrations we've had with some testing that caused us to went on an adventure of designing a drop up pull test machine. Uh, looking back, now I can live with the frustrations <laughs> instead of designing a machine. Uh, but we always, in hindsight, we are always get. Uh, and then I'll show you a little bit on a full tool chain. Uh, this is uh, some students of mine uh, that work with me on trying to take the recommendation, do the best you can with the time you have and the modeling capability you, are, you have at hand and try and put it to use. Uh, and in this case, it's for autonomous vehicle um, uh, evaluation. We've also done some significant work on um, mobility mapping, uh, but I will not show this in detail today. And then I will show a little bit about our current work and where we're going here in the, in the years to come uh, at, at an end. Um, yeah, so first a little bit about our background. So we're situated uh, 
here in uh, in Aarhus in Denmark. We're the second largest uh, city in Denmark, um, which is which is uh, huge. We are 360,000 people, <laughs> so for you it might not be so much. Aarhus University have 40,000 students, um, and um, we uh, um, are basically um, uh, running all the disciplines, both uh, medical and uh, finance and theological uh and uh, geology and engineering and all these uh, uh, uh areas uh, just recently in 2013 we were sort of uh, almost universities decided to really hit the um, uh, the engineering field uh hard as they did not really have that inside their portfolio before so there was a lot of a very old uh, over 100 years old uh, engineering schools area and when i started at Aarhus university in 2010 uh, the university, um, it, it was with the intent of uh, fully uh, uh, engulfing that uh, engineering school in the Aarhus University uh, um, um, uh, school. So, so we're rather a new department, so that's why if you Google us in mobility, you will not see us <laughs> very old. I think I'm the first one uh, in, uh, for at least for, for off-road, uh, not uh, for military applications. Uh, we have a very large agricultural department and i'll show uh, some motivational slides on, on how we got this and it's based on our agricultural work and i enjoy great support from our agricultural side and we share test uh, equipment i borrow and break and then give it back to them and uh, now i'm trying to build uh, some new equipment uh, that we can all share um uh, they are located about uh, 70 or 45 uh, 60 45 to 50 kilometers from here so it's a little uh, difficult to uh, go on a day-to-day -day basis to test but once we arrange testing it uh, we can do it there uh just a little bit about my uh, little solo uh professor research group here uh, so i've been uh, started at the university in 2010 and building it up uh, sort of slowly and i've, I've kind of kept a slow pace i guess uh, compared to others so i've, I've normally had to uh, between one and two uh, PhD or postdocs at, at any time. Uh, so far, I've graduated four PhD students uh, and had two postdocs in various positions here. And I can't keep up with the count for my uh, master's student. We, we run a lot of uh, graduate students through. Um, and we basically have a year worth of work for a master's student. So so it's, it's very nice. We can work with them for a long time uh, and, and very intense uh, four or five months. So a lot of the work you will see here is really based on uh, uh, master's uh, thesis work. Um, and currently today, uh, I have one PhD student, student Dario Ciangelo. He's done some of the last slides here, so I'll show you those. And he's working fully on, funded on defense on autonomous mobility um, in support of a NATO effort. Uh, and then I have uh, one postdoc, I will admit he just left uh, about a month ago and he was working with me on a uh, uh, drivetrain um, uh, to, uh, configuration and lifetime prediction of uh, uh, megawatt uh, drivetrain systems for wind turbines. And I have six master's students right now, and they are working in a variety of areas uh, related to my mobility work, and two of them on drivetrain. Uh, the way we get funding around here, just to uh, make you realize we are a normal business unit as everybody else. Uh, we, it, we look a lot to the EU uh, Horizon projects, and now it's called Horizon Europe, um, and in particular Euromet, which is metrology, uh, that I've had some success in uh, getting funding for, for drivetrain. Danish Innovation Fund, also for the agricultural work, and some internal funding for agriculture as well through the Danish Center for Agriculture. And then we do a lot of work on energy, renewable energy, and offshore. In the defense area, it's been uh, Danish uh, defense, uh, and I would thank uh, my uh, many collaborators, but I have not, not listed all by name here, but uh, if you are out listening here now, you know <laughs> you know who you are. People in this community, NATO community, has been uh, great uh, to work with. We all struggle finding funding different ways. NATO doesn't have a lot of funding for this, so we, we try to do it other ways. And uh, it's been great uh, uh, working with, with these folks. And I would say uh, a great, uh, thank you to the Danish Defense, uh, been uh, supportive of my work, uh, not by a lot of funding early on, but now finally we have started uh, working uh, on very directed, uh, direct uh, funding for some of these efforts. So it, it's 
been a long haul. Uh, Denmark doesn't have a research organization within the defense, so it's a, it's a not uh, straightforward to uh, to get in there. But things have changed a lot, of course, over the past uh, year here, as you know. Um, I, we have my group here has sort of been responsible of deriving curriculum in in um, gradual level education, vibration, structural, and multibody dynamics, and now also. So, of course, um, uh, vehicle dynamics in different uh, areas and also lately some stuff on uh, mechanism design and my, my ideas, of course, uh, uh, suspension and uh, ride quality uh, purposes. Uh, and also we do some work in multibody for formalisms as the recursive uh, methods for doing real-time studies. Uh, so with this introduction to who we are and where we are. Uh, I will move into uh, uh, how, how I got involved in this. And I would say uh, I started here in 10 and in, in 2000, uh, quite early on there um, in 11 uh, or, or and, and 12, I started working with that Danish Center for Agriculture. So I'll, I have a 10 slides here. Where I'll go through pretty quick where we discuss a little bit about uh, the work we've done there. First, I have an, an overview slide, but after that, I'll get into this. Um, so, so real quick, uh, if you can see some of these uh, pictures here. So, uh, what, what our multibody research, which is really the foundation of all the, the work we've done here, uh, is uh, different forms of different formalisms, as I mentioned. And our focus lately has been using this on digital twins. We look a lot at multi-resolution uh, models, and I think there's a there's a good picture here that sort of shows this. This is for wind turbine drivetrain, but it's exactly the same application to uh, our vehicle simulation. What What is it you're trying to capture? It sort of dictates the level of um, fidelity your model needs. So in, in wind, we, we we would like to predict uh, fatigue or lifetime on, on gears. And uh, uh, often, traditionally, people use very low degree of freedom models for load estimation, maybe one or two degrees of freedom through the uh, drivetrain and gearbox. Uh, and then we start adding uh, uh, higher fidelity if we want to actually capture the true loadings on the bearings and so forth. And um, uh, recently, um, we've been using some uh, software from Romax, which Hexagon purchased and Hexagon's Atoms. So we've been able to link uh, multi-body models with uh, some very uh, detailed gear uh, simulation um, uh, vendors. So that's sort of the tool chain on trying to find the level of detail necessary so you can predict something like this over here is uh, I don't know if you see do you see my house I hope you do <laughs> maybe I, oh you, you don't see my mouse maybe you do now I guess um so um so I will move the mouse on the right screen <laughs> I've been putting on another screen sorry about that so this over here is a, a pressure distribution on the gear flank and we want to make this as uh, equal as possible under loading. So that's some of the details we can get to, which is quite a, um, a, quite quite a difficult when you communicate with people. You have to predict lifetime for for 20 years of constant running, um, and um, and uh, for certification they need to run 250, 2,500 load cases with uh, with uh, 10 minutes of simulation in each load case. So it's 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 a lot of simulation. So they don't like high fidelity models. So we do a lot of work on trying to do um, um, machine learning on these things and and um, uh, uh, become more efficient. Then uh, we worked um, a lot on vehicle dynamics, and you see uh, these lower pictures here from uh, some of the work you will see later here. Um, I skipped a little bit, uh, which is unfortunate, I think, uh, but I, I, I skipped some, some th this particular picture here, I'll talk to it a little bit here. This is actually us working, I had an industrial PhD with an agricultural uh, company uh, that had, there were mainly agricultural folks, and uh, it was all about uh, sustainability and how do you uh, minimize uh, um, uh, the soil uh, compaction and those kind of issues. So they've been developing this small autonomous agricultural robot where you can fit a four meter, what is that, 12 foot um, implement in between the two sides. And it has an articulated joint in the middle. And uh, we did some work in, uh, in uh, simulating this. Uh, and we did this with the open source uh, uh, Chrono, Project Chrono, 
and uh, my PhD student there, Frederick uh, Follaire, uh, visited the guys in Wisconsin. Uh, so thanks to that. And we were able to demonstrate uh, using as uh, one of the soil models, which is the soil contact model, you know, trying to convince uh, folks that you need to really think about design of the vehicle system when you are when you're coming up with the initial designs because it had absolutely no um, load transfer from left to right so when you drive on one wheel then you end up loading it up and when it had a, a basically just a revolute joint with no friction in so what our suggestion was was to add a component like what we have behind here which happened to be a stabilizer bar so you know those of you that are Vehicle savvy, um, that's to transfer load from one side to uh, the other when you have uh, changes in terrain. So so things like this uh, really, uh, uh, we were able to demonstrate that uh, using uh, modeling and simulation 3D um, uh, methods, uh, you, you can uh, benefit from that in your design. And the other pictures I'll get back to here, but uh, uh, you see down here, um, a simulation of uh, us using an autonomy stack for doing a double lane change with a, with the uh, we call it the fed alpha the fuel efficiency demonstrator um so those are the type of work we we are getting into now and on top of this also uh, uh right the comfort and uh, also the the chair mechanics modeling and testing for these things okay i'll move on so really quick, uh, uh, I'll show you some slides here on uh, on our motivation to getting into uh, Terra Mechanics. So I'm, I listed, I think you might have seen my bio there that I'm a many year member of SAE, but I'm only a, what, four or five year member of uh, ISTVS. So uh, I, I really realized I should have joined a long time ago. <laughs> so so uh, the, um, the uh, efforts we we've been getting into is uh, in in Denmark we have a lot of uh, uh, riverways or small creeks I would call it not rivers uh, where water runs off uh, from the fields over here from the fields in the side um, then you have water runoff and it takes all the fertilizer that you put on the on the um, on the fields up here and if you get a heavy rain like we've seen recently. Uh, you can just take all the fertilizer and it runs right straight into the stream and right out into our fjords and waterways and eventually the ocean uh, for no good except for algae production and and uh, that causes uh, oxygen uh, limitations and all kinds of problems. So the idea was to um, start instead of draining all this uh, wetland, start using this uh, as a nitrogen trap uh, instead. So. So um, uh, let it gr grow uh, with maybe uh, increased water levels, let the vegetation grow um, and uh, capture that nitrogen there and then capture the vegetation by harvesting it. Um, so that's the, uh, that was our initial uh, way into this and, and, and they struggled in finding vehicles that could drive in this terrain. Um, so I got involved and said, I know everything about asphalt, well, a lot about asphalt, but this stuff, Oh boy, I don't know. So we needed to get into a soil modeling for for doing this. So I, I, I was very comfortable that we could do any vehicle configuration we could come up with. For me, it's just a bunch of joints putting things together and some inertia, and there you go. Uh, uh, but uh, I didn't know understand the interaction with the environment. So we uh, tried to see if we could come up with something to do uh, better than this less damage to the soil and faster regrowth of uh, the vegetation and uh, if for these grass in the wetland areas could be harvested multiple times that would be uh, uh, very good to get the grass off and maybe you have to go when it's more wet than than you would normally go with regular vehicles should we pick track or, or tires articulated steer Ackerman steering what should the weight be and the weight distribution and so forth so we want it to end up uh, instead of looking like this for wheels and tracks it should look like this when we've been there so that's that was our motivation into this and thinking of how we could answer this we had to get into the soil modeling so real quick this is peat soils and i've come to learn afterwards that that was probably the most difficult course into terra mechanics uh, 
So we, we started having to understand what is peat soil and um, highly uh, organic content in here. And, and it's it often seen in these lowlands or bogs. And in particular, if you um, have not drained it, it, it stays like this forever. Uh, but once you start draining it, then um, then it would deteriorate and the organic matter will uh, will uh, disappear eventually, or rot out of it, um, and um, uh, it becomes um, maybe more manageable, uh, the, the soil. But the, the problem here was we did not want to, the government does not want to drain these things because when, the, when it rots, it also gives out methane, and that's another greenhouse gas. So if we keep the water levels, that's fine. And then we had to understand how to drive on this, drive on this highly porous, lots of water in it. We took a sample of this, and it sat in my office for, uh, for I think, two years. And when I went to it again and squished on it, it still sounded like a sponge. Uh, and, and it's pretty dry what goes on in my office, I would say. <laughs> so, so interesting. Um, and then the strength is increased with this. Uh, you see all the root network and all this in there, so it becomes sort of a, a composite material. So quite a difficult to model your way out of, uh, but uh, uh, tried. Um, so uh, let me just show you a couple of things that, of course, we uh, we went through. Um, so myself and my my first postdoc, Morten Hostrup, we uh, decided then to take the agricultural department soil course, which was sort of a five-day five intensive PhD-based um, for PhD students uh, soil course. So we were put out doing these uh, soil samples. Uh, so the, you geotechnical folks and soil folks are all familiar with this. But for me, that was a, that it was a science to take a sample of this. I had no idea. Like when, So when you do it and, and you squeeze things together, you fail. So, <laughs> so I had to, to learn as we go. And uh, in our department, they had at the agricultural department, they developed their own uh, share testing machine. And I'll get uh, a little bit into the meters uh, later. Um, and um, this is basically the share test of a bevimeter, And you see the results of it here. You have the veins going in. But the ring is only uh, 60 centimeters. Or was that little 60 millimeters? So a little over two, two and a quarter inch, I think. Um, so it's. The question is: Is this confined or unconfined? Um, looks a little looks a little strenuous to me if I was sitting in here as a soil. So I guess that yields confined then. Um, but with this, you produce the 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 shear displacement curve. From this, we can generate the more Coulomb uh, curves uh, for uh, for the shear characteristics, and uh, uh, with the cohesion value and our coefficient oh, of our friction angle the phi here. As a function of normal load, we get the shear stress, and so we use these in our in our, uh, simulations of these type of models. So I guess uh, the, here's a younger version of myself. So uh, some of you might have seen this picture before, but uh, it's probably ten years ago, and um, uh, being out there with these uh, ag folks doing the soil testing. Uh, uh, you understand this process of learning. You take the course, then you try and teach it. That's really how you learn. Then you program it. Then you can't make mistakes, right? That's that's the last that's the last tough thing in in the office, right, to do. But then when you go out and collect uh, samples and test them, you really appreciate if you can program these models, right? So uh, so um, yeah, I didn't get out of this loop. Uh, I sort of stayed in this uh, uh, with the generate models and uh, do testing. So with this, I would show you uh, some of our first models in uh, in the soil uh, modeling, and and we we used here again uh, Project uh, Chrono um, as a, the open source uh, code here to try and set up a soil model for peat soil. And remember, when you get a certain distance down into the soil, you could be on a water bed, basically on flow on a floating. Uh, um, bed. It, this is not bed rock. It, this is very, very soft. So if you do a, a cone test, you you get some resistance the first uh, 10, 15, uh, 20, 30 inches, and then suddenly it just goes, uh, it just disappears. Um, so we tried to do some modeling with this uh, based on an, uh, a specific tire that our agricultural friends had done physical testing with. Um, and uh, build this uh, model here. So I'll just very quick go through. So we 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 made some boundary con conditions. So we said it's a limited space. This is our first work in this. 
So we were not that comfortable with supercomputers here. Um, we uh, had this uh, model, which was basically the spring uh, layer uh, underneath. And then we have a, a layer of subsoil particles that sort of handles the layer in between the, the very soft subsoil and, and the top surface. So these are, are connected through this horizontal structural model. So that was one way we, we, uh, we handled the fact that they, uh, they are not free to move around. They, uh, they interact with each other. Um, and then we added the topsoil particles, which are free to move around. So it becomes sort of a hybrid model here with a subsoil and, and a, a, a medium soil here, and then the topsoil, which is free, uh, free particles. Um, so with this, we uh, we assume had a bunch of assumptions: uh, homogeneous material, uh, linear elastic, uh, is how the soil would behave until a yield stress level was uh, hit, and then above that, we can compact it, and it had a time-dependent rate. Maybe I should finish this. Uh, yeah, and each subsoil represents sort of a column of soil with a given an initial height. So where do you start at? at? Um, and uh, in the horizontal side, the interaction in the horizontal direction, it does not get compact. It comes back uh, again. So you, there are some assumptions in this. Um, so the compaction, we're really looking at the vertical uh, part for the compaction. Uh, there's, uh, there is some uh, shear stiffness in the subsoil uh, because of the interaction between the particles to the boundary. And uh, when we presented this uh, earlier at an IMSD conference, some questions also, is it really realistic to have a boundary like that that can take the reaction and uh, I, I appreciate that comment um, um, and then we use viscous damping in here this is the this is the the the, the, um, the soil model so we have some initial deflection and then it differ once you start compacting it and uh, the force is depending on the current state as and you end up with a sort of a compacted state uh, afterwards um, the when when we hit the uh, go above this yield force we get the permanent compaction and also this is a uh, time depending so it is how long it's under pressure um so this is how we build the model we we interacted with the environment through the red connections here with the call it ground and then uh, the inner connection were these uh, green uh, dots here uh, green line segments here and we picked the initial of these uh, springs to be 90% of the particle di diameter. And the shear stiffness, you can sort of call that hex hexagonal uh, because you have uh, the six springs uh, going around here. Uh, so with this, we're able to uh, uh, estimate um, uh, some, some uh, stiffnesses, the vertical stiffness, vertical compaction stiffness, vertical damping, and yield stress and compaction rates. So these are some of the numbers we need uh to to go from um uh from our spring from our what you say um uh, our soil characteristics the physics of the soil to uh, the the discrete this is really a discrete element model the dis the char the, um, the characteristics of the discrete element model so we have to go back and forth we're always fighting a little bit with these agricultural folks uh, about well what is you talk about springs in your simulation but we we talk about the physics of the soil the physics physical characteristics that we're used to talking about so uh, so 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 there's always that discussion how do you go from one uh, from the physics to the model um uh, so with this we uh, uh try to to actually do some validation so this is our first uh, work in validation looking at uh, some tests that were done with these uh, out at our agricultural uh, department in uh, in in Folum here. So these are my uh, colleagues out there, Mathieu Lemande and Pierre Schring. They're very known in the agricultural area, um, and they've developed a lot of these uh, sensors. Uh, they drill them in in the soil. They make a, um, a, a what should I say? A, a, they a, a trench <laughs> next to the, the test area, and then they drill holes in and they stick these. Uh, probes uh, through that can measure the, the stresses, vertical and also now uh, horizontal stresses. So they have now sensors in multiple directions to uh, also account for traction. So that, that's some of the new stuff we're working with them on is, is uh, not just look at normal stress, but so, uh, on the traction. Uh, so there's a paper here where the data that we're trying to compare to uh, is coming from. And so these are some of the simulation results that uh, we were uh, generating. 
and this is some of the test data that uh, they were able to get uh, or that they get from a, from a, a non-tilled soil and a tilled soil. And tilled meaning it's a loose and, and worked. Uh, and you can sort of see when you have it worked, you get the, um, this is by the way, uh, at a certain depth. I can't remember exactly if it is the 0.3 meters here, but it's at a certain depth we're looking at this. Um, and you can see when it's a uh, very uh, soft, uh, the soil, you, you, you get these um, tendencies to have some pressure uh, spikes around the edges of the tire. Uh, so this is for a fixed tire pressure. Um, then see this will run here and this is how our simulation model then was was able to capture this as we go over the 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 soil okay so uh, uh some other results we uh, could get uh, out of this is uh uh, sinkage of the wheel, so basically this turns into be rut depth. So with these type of models, we can have a, a, an idea for rut depth. Uh, you, you saw the equations, so they're very, very simple models and, 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 and few parameters we need. So if we can uh, measure something on the go, for instance, then uh, this it, it could be quite quick to adapt to these. We haven't done that yet, but this is some of the stuff we're looking into. Okay, uh, so just uh, a quick, uh, what, what we, uh, from the agricultural part here. So we were able to make this uh, rate dependent um, and permanent deformation compaction of subsoil, which is really the question we were asked back then. And it's highly deformable. And this is uh, becomes very critical when you try to uh, investigate uh, different types of threats. I totally agree that we did not have the resolution necessary to do that with that model, but it just shows the way we, that we could go. Um, and uh, we had uh, much fewer degrees of freedom, as I mentioned, than we would have if we were to use a pure discrete element model uh, to, to capture this. And, and we don't care what goes on further down as long as we get the, the gross motion of the, the, the soil at the, at the subsurface level there. Um, and we actually also uh, were able to uh, incorporate some shear characteristics. I didn't show that here, but we did incorporate some root characteristics that, that showed uh, sort of elastic behavior. And then you had sort of a yield as you're pulling the root out of the, out of the, out of the soil, first elastic and then yield when you pull the root out. And then if the root breaks and you, have, and you lose that complete stiffness you had before. So, uh, so we're able to uh, uh, capture some of this as well. Okay, so now we shift gears. So let's uh, have a quick drink of water. So now I'll go in and talk a little bit more about our our work here in the uh, uh, next generation NATO reference mobility model. Model. So I would I would say here um, that there was a lot of reports out. Uh, and I recommend the reading the NATO uh, Advanced Vehicle Technology Panels, their report for the work on uh, on 348, which 248, I'm sorry, which is a two 300 page long report that describes all of the the segment, all of the the items I will I will very quickly cover here in a, in a figure afterwards. So so there is a there is a there is, and it's publicly available, so you can you can find this on the on the next generation uh, NRMM model. Um, but in short, what was the purpose of this? So, so most of you or some of you are probably familiar with the NATO reference mobility model, which I, I am very impressed and very um, humble uh, to the work done for all the people uh, working with this for, for all those years. And it basically arose uh, post-World War II, a need for uh, being able to better predict um, mobility of uh, military vehicles in in the off-road terrains. So uh, NRMM contains uh, many different modules, uh, not just uh, soil, soil is one of them, but also um, visibility, vegetation, and uh, um, slopes, and um, um, vehicle dynamics even in, um, in, uh, in maybe uh, simpler forms than what I have referred to uh, here uh, uh, previously. Um, but still, it's all there. And all these modules eventually link up to a capability of uh, moving a, uh, across a terrain at a given speed, 
in a in a in a terrain unit that has um, I would say uh, similar characteristics. So that's the point of NGNIMM. It's a it's a tool for supporting three things: uh, design and acquisition um, and operational planning. So if you can't communicate the right uh, communicate what you want, it's hard to design for it and once you're done with this design, it would be nice if somebody can actually use it in an operational setting. So I think uh, most of us that got, um, I wouldn't say conned into volunteering a lot of time into this, but uh, most of us that got intrigued by this, uh, these questions were thinking, this is great, right? The, the NGNIMM will basically give us the solution to uh, write the right specs when you do acquisition. And make the perfect design to fulfill those specs and the operational people can even try and run it before the thing is built so so it's it's it, it really sounds good and to this day that's probably still why i get up in the morning and try it and, and and spend time on this is because i think the overall idea is uh, is 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 exciting uh, but there's a long way to get there and of course it's all the variations in uh, soil and unknowns and unstructural environments that causes us to uh, not be able to be quite there. And as I said earlier, the level of fidelity of the models, if, when you don't know exactly what people are going to use the model for, it's hard to make a feasible fidelity that they will actually use. Uh, so I think that's one of the things I've learned over the years is uh, overcomplicating something for a simple answer, where you need a simple answer, is, uh, is not a way to get customers in this business, I think. So that that's uh, some of the work we're working on going forward is to come with these recommendations as to when is enough enough. So, uh, so uh, what uh, was it NRMM could deliver at the end of the day? Well, you give it some very simple um, uh, parameters in terms of some some very simple suspension characteristics. Um, there's a microphone that needs muted. Okay, some very simple. Um, um, vehicle design characteristics, uh, very few numbers, and you can build a sort of an in-plane vehicle model uh, where you can have ride quality, you can have um, you can have some ideas of what is its cornering capability without actually doing a 3D uh, cornering, but you still know something about TO2H is our favorite term there when it comes to rollover propensity, track width divided by two times the height of the CG. That tells you something about how fast you can turn. And with simple numbers like this, you can, you know, it's the 80-20 or 90-10 rule. You can go a long ways with that. Um, so, so at the end of this was, was a map. Uh, the issue I've had for a long time with, with the maps is that uh, which direction we're going. And then people are saying, well, they're omnidirectional. Okay. Uh, it makes a huge difference for me when I'm out running. Uh, it's been a few years. If I go uphill or downhill or a side slope, uh, I prefer downhill running. Uh, so, so it's a, uh, it, it, this omnidirectional, it really is, uh, for, for me, it comes down to you, you have to give the direction when you when you talk about some performance. Um, and so that's that's the one thing we're trying to take advantage of. Um, and it's also the 3D part, which means things like the roll stabilizer bar behind me there, the transfers load from left to right, huge impact on, on uh, uh, contact patch load, which is huge impact on tractive capability. So that's very important to include. Um, and then things like ride quality. So I've been in a, in a, a subgroup with the NATO um, uh, work here on ride quality and how to uh, account for uh, 3D terrain. So left and right input to the suspension is not the same. And, and, and that's very important because uh, with very high CG vehicles, you sit up high, and if you start getting a lot of roll or pitch motion, your, your neck is going to uh, affect how long you can sit there and handle this. So, so there's some work done, so stay tuned in terms of uh, better describing what you need and how you should test for it. Um, and then also the other thing of next generation NRMM, it, it was really uh, with, with this upgrade in the 3D physics-based modeling, uh, we also wanted to have a, what we call a dynamic placeholder for verification and validation of these modeling and simulations of new technology. So we have um, uh, some uh, tests and some terrains that could be uh, soft soil characteristics that are shared. Uh, so you can use these 
and and um, use that to validate your model with. And then you can maybe try some new technology, traction control, better damping, or other things. And uh, and and we we have a place to communicate in a common language. Um, I would say. Uh, uh, one thing I'm missing on this slide here is also the geospatial input. Uh, so you should be able to, uh, GNRMM is also about taking actual physical terrain. How do you geospatially represent that and the characteristics in it? So there's been a lot of work done there and I'll show that in, 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 our, in our standard figure here afterwards. Um, and then we have uh, used this as a guidance for our development of what we call the NATO standard 4013 and it's supporting document the uh, allied modeling and what is the simulation publication? I think it is. Um, there's zero six, which me, which is really where all the work is stated, uh, and 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 uh, I believe that one is also for freely uh, download, and it it uh, it um, it contains uh, uh, the the implementation, the tests, the, the the overalls. You don't have to read the 300 page report. You can you can stay with the 100 and 170 page report here. I think it is. Something like that. Um, so it, that that was uh, all the work. It wasn't enough to just do the work. It was also important to get a, a standard and recommendation coming out of this. Now I'll go to uh, the, the 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 slide here um, that captures uh, the overall idea of of NG and IMM. So, so most of you have probably seen this before. I'd say all of us that was involved in the AVT two forty eight work had some say in this slide deck, or, and we made some of it, but I will give the full credit to Radu Seban from the University of Wisconsin. He actually put the slide and thoughts together, and the only thing I could catch him as was he had a Hummer instead of the, the Fed Alpha vehicle in here. But um, it, this, uh, this shows, uh, uh, this shows the, 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 the overall architecture of NG and IMM uh, and the uh, capabilities you have to uh, understand if you want to uh, adhere to it. So there's a data environment, which is what I talked about. How do you get your data? And we had uh, some great work done by uh, multiple uh, folks, uh, Ryan Williams at KRC, Matthias Lassippen from CPA in Germany, uh, and others, many others, uh, did a lot of work in the, in the care, in the describing this. How do you obtain this geospatial information? What resolution should you get it at? How do you fill in if you don't have enough? And all these things, and where you get your sources from, and how much data do you really need in there? So I will say, based on my soil model I showed before, we ended up, I think we, we, we stuck with two levels. I mean, we, if we were to get more levels of soil characteristics going down, um, uh, we, I think we were struggling uh, getting that data, right? You have to, so the more model, more fidelity you get, the more data you have to fill in there and the harder it is to get it. So there is a balance there. Uh, so I think we've ended up with two uh, two levels of uh, like you can have two layers in your soil basically. Uh, so moisture content and uh, percent silt and clay and all this is 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 part of these uh, descriptions and the density and, and so forth. So I, I so you you need this, you need a vehicle uh, that you're interested in and the vehicle data and we had in this case we had a, a fuel efficiency demonstrator which is the one you see here. Um, uh, that that's a lot of data uh, that was there because it was actually built, uh, and we have all that for those who want to redo it. It's publicly available. Um, um, that that data um, uh, you then use to build a model. Now, what if you didn't have that much data? So that's the thing with model resolution. Can you get away with less? Um, and I'll show an example of less uh, in a, in a minute. Uh, and then you need the scenario data. The scenario for us is uh, really what are the tests you're going to do. And uh, for users in the future, it's like, what, what is the terrain? Where are you going to go? What, what are your maneuvers? What are you planning on doing? Are you, are you planning fastest route from A to B? Are you doing multi-pass because you're con convoying or something? Um, so you need to define these things also. And we, we use them for model validation, uh, some, uh, a set number of uh, tests, and I'll show those uh, in a minute also. Then you go into your modeling and simulation environment. You need to build a vehicle model that and for here, we mean it has to be able to adhere to 3D physics. So it has to have roll, uh, so you can capture uh, contact stress in the contact patch. Um, so at least you, you need to understand how much you need here for the, for, for the questions that you're trying to answer. 
So uh, what we've come to realize here is with our robotic uh, or autonomous vehicle stuff, you know, we realize that uh, they can process the cameras uh, very fast. Um, so we're going really slow to be able to uh, process everything. And um, and then do you really need a full 3D model? No, I think my five degree freedom model I teach in class is much sufficient for this. Um, but, but as speed goes up, this becomes uh, crucial. Uh, and if you're on a side slope, load distribution becomes uh, important also. Um, and then we had a uh, different uh, um, uh, terrain uh, ways of characterizing the terrain. And we have split it into two, and we're not saying this is all there is, but at least this is sort of the level of fidelity we think we think you minimum need, and maybe the level of fidelity that could be on the maximum side if you really want to get into the weeds. So simple terror mechanics based on uh, uh, Becker Wong theory, uh, Yanoshi Hanamoto and, uh, and Rees, uh, um, so all the, the good stuff from, from our, our uh, almost founding fathers in this, uh, is this area. So th this is what goes into the simple terror mechanics. Um, and I think when it comes to operational use, uh, either you it seems like you have to go with this or you have to do some sort of learning uh, machine learning models in the in the more complex methods to be able to pr produce the maps you need fast enough i would say uh, when it again what are you trying to do if you're trying to produce mobility maps maybe this is a way to go if you're trying to design the next suspension setup or the next tire tread design or the pressure regulator system Maybe you need to move on to the complex terror mechanics. Uh, so here we represent it by discrete element models. It could be SPH, so smooth particle hydrodynamics, or it could be FEM approaches. Um, so that, that, but this is really a comp, uh, high fidelity models, uh, and we try to make we try to indicate that you ought to be able to capture the fact that there's a tread and how is the interaction with the tread between the, the soil and tread. You know, here we do it sort of uh, based on testing curves, and and uh, uh, and uh, and here you can actually do it with the modeling. Um, and then we also require in um, the NGNIMM uh, framework that you have to be able to quantify uncertainty. So you you should uh, include the um, uh, uncertainty in your input uh, parameters and see what effect that has on on the output that you are trying to reduce your performance uh, characteristics, maybe speed. Uh, and so forth. And you should take these performance results and then map it back out to your original environment in terms of in terms of these operational maps where you can have confidence in these depending on the confidence in your input. So this is what we mean by stochastic mobility maps. And then we have all our derived uh, performance characteristics. So ride quality, for instance, uh, grade performance, uh, and and these are some um, measures. Uh, maybe I wouldn't call it static, but it but it's measures you get from uh, driving over a certain terrain for a certain time, and then you know what is the speed you can go at, for instance, for for ride quality for six watt of solar power, for instance. Great performance. Oftentimes we end up here saying if you go in a constant speed, this is the grade you can negotiate uh, both hard, but also in particular soft soil, and. As you know, if you uh, if you start using inertia as your driver, <laughs> so if you can get some of the, a, a starting go before you go, uh, uh, clearly you can make it further if you use um, uh, smart uh, thinking. You're driving if you know what the oncoming terrain looks like. This doesn't take that into account. So let, let, I'll get back to this later. This is more like steady state in a dynamic simulation performance. Um, so then we moved on in uh, in um, in our NGNIMM work, and this is uh, I can't see the list of participants. Maybe that's a good thing. I'd, I'd get nervous, <laughs> but but uh, some of the great uh, colleagues that, uh, working on this also. This is Mike McCullough from BAE Systems that helped uh, uh, designing this. Uh, uh, we call it the next generation NRMM maturity scale, which is really based on a simulation maturity scale out of uh, NAFIMS, so the Association for Fine Element Modeling and, and uh, Simulation Modeling. Uh, but we added a few other items in here. Uh, and I think this is, um, this is quite key, um, that we have these seven levels. Uh, and I would say the first five levels are really uh, good, good to have, but um, but you need to go a little further than that, I think. 
So the, so I'll go through it really quick. So demonstration is just that you can build something that that uh, turns right if you turn the steering wheel to the right. And so that's you have a model that seems to be working. So this is the thing about verification versus validation. So did you did you build the the did you build the the right model or did you build the model right? Um, so uh, the latter is the validation. Uh, so here it's the did you build the right model? So so does it represent the physics you expect? Parameter sensitivity demonstration to so this pure simulation number two here. Um, you uh, you get an ex expected uh, performance change when you uh, do some uh, changes in the input uh, variables or, or parameters. Um, and uh, again, this is just in simulation, just validating that it makes sense that it's working. Then you can independent user verification. You can you can demonstrate uh, and and correlate that your uh, simulation is uh, working uh, according to how. Uh, um, uh, Others might think it should work. So, uh, so this is you do the best with what you have to to validate it. A cross code verification. If you can find another accepted mobility uh, software tool that did the same thing, can you validate against this? And maybe that one has been validated against. Uh, uh, well, I should keep it as as if you can validate it against another accepted uh, mobility code. Not that that had to do the do the physical uh, validation, but if it has done that. Because it's an accepted code, then if they just predict some simulation results, you're 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 in a better place if you can match that. Then now we move into actually having real data, so that's the calibration part. So now we calibrate to real vehicle test data, um, uh, and with this, it's there can be things you need to uh, to set up and tune in your simulation model, and you allow yourself to have a few uh, uh, test data so you can calibrate to. Then we move into the, the fun part, which is the validation part. Now, can you predict uh, speed on a slope in soft soil without, um, uh, le based on the uh, parameters you were given about the soil? And and thereby, uh, did, are you a model capable of, uh, did you have enough parameters for your model? And does your model treat those data well enough that you can predict um, uh, the speed on that slope? So that's a validation. So blind correlation to real vehicle test data. And then seven, which is the the parameter variation validation, where you then start blindly being able to uh, uh, validate your performance results as you uh, as you are validating uh, as you are changing input parameters. So if I change uh, small input parameters on the physical vehicle, and I see what the test data shows, could you predict that same result with your simulation model? So um, we did a, a couple. Let me, so we did a, a few things here, and I, I'm not including all of this. There is a, there is a, an, a, um, 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 ISTVS. No, sorry, a, um, a paper at um, um, Ground Vehicle System Centers uh, conference uh, um, in Detroit. There on in Novi, we we presented this. Sorry, I lost the name uh, for now, but uh, it's. We, we did a paper on the benchmarks we did. We invited a number of uh, software companies uh, in the uh, Corona from Wisconsin, one of them, Adams, uh, Recodyne, um, uh, CM Labs, uh, Vortex Studio from uh, from CM Labs. And I can't remember if there were others um, uh, to try and do the best they could do in a, in a benchmark. And we had a benchmark on an M113 Track vehicle based on uh, Dr. Wong's and um, and uh, John Thomas's uh, publications um, from the 80s with the data. So we don't have any measured data. I think there are some coming uh, available now uh, or sh uh, shortly uh, from an actual measured vehicle. Um, um, th th this was also an actual measured vehicle, but one they used in uh, in Canada for a study. Uh, so, so we had a, a good a, the input data and also a particular very detailed information about the track uh, pad and the size and the curvature and the height and all this. So, if people were to simulate the discrete element models or other models, uh, the interaction with the soil was captured here. Uh, the suspension system, the road arm angle, the initial uh, position in terms of the free length of the spring and what is the what is the, the static position. All this was given and dampers on some of the road wheels. 
um, all this stuff was given. And I believe this is also available um, uh, today. The, uh, the papers are, of course, available, but the, um, there's a report out of this that is available also. Um, so with this, uh, uh, the simulation folks were able to build simulations and, and try and predict the hard surface uh, versus soft soil uh, uh, mobility. Um, I will refer to that paper to show the results, but uh, I can tell you uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the issue was everybody was able to simulate things pretty well on hard surface, but when it came to soft soil, what we demonstrated here was that there was uh, obviously sort of a lack in being able to do soft soil uh, simulations and dynamic maneuvers. Um, uh, here is another benchmark. This is thanks to uh, NATC uh, in Nevada. They uh, provided uh, another demonstrator they had uh, and gave the data uh, necessary for this. And the, the, the reason why we were uh, keen on picking a vehicle like this was because it, it is a four-wheel independent suspension, four-wheel drive. It had a very complex uh, suspension set up with hydraulic um, uh, accumulators and for the damping. So it has a, an additional um, uh, uh, what should I say, valve controlled uh, uh, cross uh, uh, stiffness there. So it's, so basically the roll stabilizer bar was controlled through uh, through uh, the hydraulics. And we had the characteristics of this. They had built, um, the, I believe that was an Adams model that they had validated and we were able to get a lot of the um, uh, data from, from this model to be able to build with the other uh, vendors so they could incorporate it. We also were able to get the Michelin uh, data, uh, Pacheco data for this, uh, and we also had, um, I believe we have, we had uh, a, a, a 3D contact, um, a 3D uh, scan of a, of a surface here. For, so some people were using this to capture the interaction with the soil. Um, then with this, we did a number of uh, benchmark tests, uh, and these are sort of the ones that are reflected in the uh, Stanrec 4013 um, or the AMSP-06, which is really where the data is uh, in included. So there is a much further detailed description of all these tests, but we tried to base them as much as we could on existing standards. Um, so we use uh, SAEJ-66 for, for steering performance, wall-to-wall -wall and state-of-state -state cornering. Uh, double lane chains, we use the NATO double lane chains according to the Allied Vehicle Testing Procedure 03-160W. Uh, we uh, did the uh, side uh, slope stability, um, and this was sort of guided by a technical operating procedure, but uh, I believe our final uh, version of this was slightly different, and it was about being able to negotiate an obstacle on a side slope. And it was mainly at low speed, but could you get back on your on your intended path? That was the what was the the issue here. Uh, the both on paved and unpaved services surfaces, straight line acceleration, uh, ride quality. Uh, so we um, had uh, three uh, in the benchmarks. We had three different uh, um, uh, ride courses, and all these all these testings were done at the. Kivina Research Center, so thanks to, to their heavy involvement in this as well. So the tests were actually done at Kivina Research Center and the vehicle provided by Ground Vehicle System Center. Um, so there were three um, uh, RMS courses uh, there that was built for the, for, the, for the purpose here. And there was also, they were able to straddle two different courses such that you could get uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, 3D uh, input. Um, a little discussion on uh, if it's fair to give it one RMS on one side and another on another side, if that's really 3D. But uh, but anyway, it's a good uh, uh, approach at looking at, uh, at uh, showing the effects of this. Um, uh, there was obstacle, uh, also, of course, two and a half G, half round uh, for suspension and damping characteristics. So, so I would say, uh, oopsie. This here is by far the hardest if you want the right quality. I, I, my opinion here is by far the hardest uh, requirement in terms of vehicle fidelity modeling. If you want to capture the right quality, you really have to have everything in a row here to, uh, to do this. Um, uh, obstacle crossing, uh, step uh, crossing, um, uh, gaps, uh, what do you call them, tank traps and others. Um, there was a, a number of different uh, setups for this that you run the vehicle through. Then we had, a, then we go, in, this is all hard surface uh, testing. Then you go into off-road trafficability, so single and multi-pass 
uh, soil uh, or um, um, a test, a drop-up hole according to a technical operating procedure, and also motion resistance uh, you need to capture so you can get the motion resistance both on hard surface and in the soil so you can distinguish the running gear versus the, the soil motion resistance. Um, then there's a closed loop uh, traverse, and this one here was uh, to look at fuel um, management. We didn't do a lot of, uh, I don't think we did it in simulation. Uh, we came up with a test. I don't think we validated that in the actual uh, KSC testing. But we came up with a sort of a, a, some, some hills that you should negotiate a, a number of times and come up with some energy consumption um, ideas. <clears throat> so, um, before I go into a detailed test into this, I just want to say uh, we, we, we did this. It was sort of a round robin thing. We, we, people were not allowed to see any of the test data and the results uh, came back. Uh, maybe I can show uh, afterwards here, but the, the results, uh, people gave back a long report, a lot of dedicated work going into this. And then uh, I and my students were tasked with the, with the unfair uh, uh, job of uh, uh, characterizing how well did they do and I think the bottom line um, uh, is that everybody can do a hard surface uh, simulations to, uh, to a, a pretty good extent. Uh, and if, we, if they had more money, I'm sure they could hit it uh, much closer. But everybody struggled with soft soil uh, part. And again, you got to keep in mind the level of time that goes into um, um, the simulation part versus the output you get. Uh, we learned a lot from this benchmark, and this basically became the conclusion of this was basically um, we need we need more soft soil work. So, quick drink of water. So what what we ended up uh, um, uh, we ended up dragging ourselves into a rabbit hole. I don't know if anybody knows what it feels like, but but. Um, uh, we came out of the rabbit hole again uh, a year or two later uh, with, with, with some perspectives on this. So um, it, it came down to, and I've said a little bit of, of history in this also. So NRMM, as I said before, is a, is a sort of a quasi-static simulation tool. It, it gives you um, uh, your ability to generate tractive uh, force uh, in a given uh, uh, soil. And then I think, to be fair here, most of us, when you then predict how, and I say us because we, we did a demonstration later where we uh, also build a simulation for this. When you then predict what you can do on a slope, you, you, you scale with, um, with the gravity angle of gravity, uh, that the, you scale with the angle of the slope. Uh, that is, of course, not quite true because soil becomes looser um, in the, in the, in the, it becomes looser once you start uh, changing the, dire the direction of the gravity vector. Um, uh, but to produce some of these results here, I, I, um, I believe that at least we uh, did uh, uh, a lot of this by uh, uh, putting in, uh, um, scaling the, the drop-up hole with the angle we could go at. Um, actually, that's actually that's not true. Uh, Sorry, but when we did this, we had our 3D model, and of course, it's important because the suspension changes. So then we uh, we we you run it again on a slope, but we didn't change the soil parameters. That's what I should say. Um, we did we did some other work with the agricultural folks where we had very limited uh, test data, and that's where we did this uh, scaling. We told them that's what we did. Anyway. Um, so be careful on slopes. It might not be the same as uh, uh, when you do the soil testing on the, on the flat surface. The slope might be a different uh, animal because the gravity vector is not uh, perpendicular to the surface, um, and thereby the, the 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 weight of the soil is different, um, felt in the direction of the slope normal. Um, so the uh, uh, I, I would say the, the the reason why we got into uh, to, uh, to to looking at the, um, the drawbar pole test was that uh, we uh, we realized uh, with some discussions from Dr. Wong actually some great discussions and the team the test team at KRC and ourselves and others uh, folks doing simulations um, we we realized that uh, that these tests can become quite dynamic uh, and it 
and uh, and then it's then we start thinking maybe that's why our results don't match. So say it in a nice way. So uh, so I think um, uh, let's try and eliminate the variables going into this so we get to the core of the problem so you get as clean as a test as possible to to test against. So so th so the, I want to set the the stage here for why we got into this work and it's really because. We, we are not trying to look at a vehicle you're purchasing, you go for a test drive and feel like how it's, it's going. We're trying to do these tests to validate simulation models. So we cannot validate them in the simplest, maybe unrealistic form of driving. If that doesn't work, then I don't trust it in the, unre in the realistic, crazy form of driving. So I think that was, that was really the, the reason behind this. Let's eliminate all these outside questions that came about not keeping constant speed in a drop-off hole test by building a test setup that could do this. So, so as you saw before, I, oh, I gotta go over here. So, um, um, uh, so, so uh, certain capabilities of vehicle modeling is necessary. And then we also need to validate this. So you get down to maturity uh, six and seven, uh, you need to calibrate in five and six and seven, you actually have to, to do some predictions. So to have confidence in this, we need, we need to do this uh, th these uh, um, simulation validations. So that's why we uh, looked at this. And the, the recommendation we had for the drawback pool was uh, this technical operating procedure 2-2-604, which talks about looking at the available power of a test vehicle in as many gear combinations as possible from zero to full speed. Uh, each test is held long enough to obtain steady st state condition in both speed and drawback pool. Um, I both speed and drawback pool is stabilized. So I think this became uh, uh, hard. Uh, and remember, maybe on on hard surface, it's 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 easier to do on soft soil to have a homogeneous test area of soil that you that you want to validate against. It's a lot of real estate if you were to drive exactly like the top says. So so what the um, so what, what we would like to do is to design the test so you can get as much clean data as possible. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to uh, have a simulation model um, uh, where we have confidence that it can also extend to other, uh, other events than the actual test we did. So with that in mind, let's take a quick look here at a, at a drawback pull test. Let me see if this is running. So this is that alpha vehicle you see here, and this was done at KRC, Kivina Research Center at Michigan Tech University in 2018. We had a very press schedule, I would say, for, for doing this. This was part of our, uh, we call that a corporate demonstration, cooperative demonstration of technology. It's a NATO event where you show the technology is NG and IMM, and we demonstrate how, to, how it's used. Um, and this is then, only the part of gaining confidence in your simulations models, why we spent time showing this. I would say the outcome is mobility maps. Those are the ones you need. But we, we had to do the first steps first, right? So here's a, here's a test, and I know there's, oopsie daisy. Hmm. Here's a test, and I know there's audio on it, so I hope it. Turn it off here a little bit. I don't know if you can hear it or not. But you see the vehicle going into the test range. And then what people uh, have done is, is then you go at a certain speed and the pedal to the metal is down. Um, let me play it one more time here and maybe stop uh, talking words important. But, but but try and notice that I wouldn't call that particularly steady state. So you're going in on the soil. So after it digs down there, there's really no reason to continue because you get, yeah, you don't need that uh, data. You dig into another layer potentially. But the, the point is here, just by seeing that he's decelerating, you have inertia forces. So, so we, you need to subtract that from your drawback pool. I actually add it because I think it's a negative when you say x, x double dot is negative. So you add it to the drawback pool results. Um, 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 and, but the other thing that's hard to see here, uh, and I would say this was a very well conducted test, uh, 
uh, but the other thing that can be hard is that you you can get some bouncing in the cables and uh, and, uh, and and just some front or after acceleration that uh, that is not uh, uh, really what you're looking for. So so uh, let, let me um, let me show a couple more tests here. This is so now you saw the first demonstration of technology. This here is uh, our second demonstration of technology that we did in Europe. So the first one was at KRC, and we. We did another one in Europe, in Trier, in uh, 2020. Uh, um, it was actually just about a year ago now. It was late May uh, 2022. So myself and Dr. Jay Akma and uh, Michael Hunling are our co-chairs of this event. Um, and here you see two vehicles, a track vehicle over here. Uh, it's a smaller reconnaissance type uh, vehicle. It's called the Weasel. It's in service still. Um, uh, 4.8 ton, and then we have the Mongo, and it's from KMW. And I don't know if uh, anybody from KMW is on, but uh, they told me this is not a good vehicle for uh, for mobility because it was, uh, uh, you know, not built for that purpose. Uh, it was built for cleaning the streets and stuff. So, so uh, let, let, no, uh, no, um, no hardship against the design here. But it was a good vehicle for demonstrating uh, our test setup because it had a, a gross vehicle weight rating of 5.3 tons, and we could only handle drop up pull up to four tons of what I'm about to show here. Um, so um, th these were instrumented in different ways uh, with uh, uh, Kistler wheel force transducers, very nice. Unfortunately, they weren't all uh, producing results of producing data, so I don't have a lot of validation data from this. Um, and then uh, similar here with the um, the track vehicle, there's torque transducers on the on the sprockets in the which are in the front of this vehicle here. Um, and uh, I just want to show you a couple things. I, I I would like to invite myself to talk more about these demonstrations another time, maybe. But uh, what we tried to do here was to have a uh, dry versus wet. So we actually watered the area overnight, and um, and came back the next day. But but it's a very stiff uh, soil, a lot of clay in this. Um, uh, so it took a long time for the water to get in. So we, we really just ended up with a with a muddy surface, slippery surface instead. Um, but uh, I'll play uh, uh, some of the. So this is our new uh, test up test setup where we. Uh, uh, it seems like it's not going through so smooth maybe yeah i don't think you're seeing it yeah i can i can tell you anything based on this <laughs> transmission of the video but uh, um what we are doing here is that we're we're trying to keep constant speed in the test So he goes slowly uh, forward at, at three kilometers an hour, whatever we set it at. And then uh, he slowly increases his wheel speed by and thereby increasing slip. But no goes any better. So this is our uh, weasel track vehicle. I wish I could tell you that it's running really smooth here. It's not. <laughs> So what you hear, I don't know if you hear it, but this is coming through so poorly. But uh, when he hunks the horn, is basically I started at the cable that we're rolling out here is following him. This is the the and then he hunks the horn. So I'll show that I'll first illustrate and introduce me kindly here. And this is an article, uh, um, a figure I have from George, and I, I have I have lost where it was we got it from. So I'll. I'll verbally make it here. The figure came from George, and he knows what the publication is. So it's not my figure. But it's sort of an ideal, idealistic um, uh, figure that show what, the, oh, over here on the right, um, that shows what a drawback pull test should look like. So the way we do slip calculations on off-road uh, is we would like to see one or 100% or at when the vehicle is immobilized. And that means when the GPS speed, so the vehicle, it's the speed the vehicle is moving with is zero, 
in relation to what the tire is moving at or the track speed the track is moving at. So when, when the vehicle is not moving, but the track is moving, you, you have a slip of 100%. And, you know, some people flip this around if it's on hard surface for, for braking and traction of, of, of ground vehicles uh, on, um, on, on asphalt and paved roads. But for a soft soil, we always do it this way here. So that, that took me six months before I realized why we couldn't match things. So <laughs> just a just, uh, little uh, history. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, the point that uh, uh, is illustrated by the figure here is uh, that as we increase slip, uh, then we have a drawback pull coefficient, which is basically the drawback pull divided by the weight of the vehicle. And it, it will go up and your slip goes up and it could look like this. So I have another example on the left here that's actually true uh, test data, but you can see the trend here, right? It goes, it goes up. It looks like this one's coming down a little bit, but but in this case, this is a, a, an example here. Let's say it goes up and it says we're going to continue generating drawbar pull all the way up till we are immobilized. In this case here, maybe it's not the case down here. Don't look at this here because the vehicle uh, dug into harder surface, so I, I wouldn't trust this. You should look at this uh, continuation down here. So. So, but realistically, would you want to go there? You're wearing all your tires and you're probably digging a big hole as you're doing this. So, uh, so most likely this is not uh, where you would be operating. And I think uh, others have recommended uh, if you are to report drop up hole capability, uh, give it to us at 20% slip and maybe at 80% slip. Then you have two numbers. But I would argue in a figure like this, a 20% slip, you know, who says you'd be 20 or 10 or, or whatever. So I, I like to see the figure so you can you see where, where you're at. Um, but what George pointed out to me uh, was uh, that um, that uh, we, we, you also like to look at this work index curve, which is basically the relation of the power. So the power input, torque times rotational speed, in relation to the power output, which is force times velocity. Uh, um, so when you get this, you can see you have actually have a peak of this. When are you utilizing the, the input power the best? And and maybe that's a good thing to report things at. At least you should be aware of this plot as well and maybe maybe include that. So I, I recommend that in the standard rec to, to make these plots. Um, I, I agree with George on that. This, this is really what you want to want to look at, of course. Um, but the point we had was that uh, some of our testing and I think this here might have been one of the original testings, the light blue one here. You, you see that that uh, when you're doing the test, not by purpose of anybody, but just simply by the means of when does the soil fail and start slipping. So when are you maybe up on something here that comes down, if the blue, if the blue curve had come down here, then, then uh, you are losing, um, uh, th then suddenly you lose the grip and suddenly the wheel starts spinning up. Uh, um and um and 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 you uh what should i say you you might not be able to populate this curve very nicely uh, and also it can happen if the if the holdback vehicle uh if he's braking faster uh than uh, or, or not steady braking you you can lose some of these slip values here that you're interested in at least you don't get data resolution enough so after a lot of discussions back and forth between test folks and simulation folks and it was in particular it, uh, Dr. Wong and, uh, and uh, the folks at KRC, um, and I was in the middle, uh, and uh, it was it was uh, very uh, pleasant, I will say. It could have been um, much worse, but <laughs> it was pleasant. And the point was, let's try instead and and, and fix these uh, areas of uh, slip, so we 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 know that we get certain. And the way you do that is by driving and tell the guy to keep the the track or tire speed at a certain level. And do that at five different levels. Here it looks like uh, no no draw bar pull here, and then here there was some draw bar pull, uh, and and he tried to keep it at a some constant speed. The the vehicle was moving at a constant speed, and the track and tire was moving at a constant speed to generate a a, a very isolated blob here. And here he's maybe a little better at it, and another one here, and another one there. So at, by this at least we were able to sort of try and get more data points in spread out over the curve. Okay. Um, so then we decided after some discussions and uh, and looking back, a lot of work, let's build a hydraulic winch or let's build a winch bait system. And I know other people have done it, NHCC has mentioned it, and I think others have done it as well. Um, um, 
And the idea is here, you get rid of the whole back vehicle and you do a, a winch that is rolling out the cable. So we so we uh, wanted to do a test that looks like this here. So oh, over here. So if you if you look at this plot here, what, what are we trying to look at? So we wanting to give the vehicle GPS speed, which is the blue one. We want to say it's in this here is two and a half kilometers an hour. So and thereby nobody can say we didn't do steady state. Uh, we didn't. Yeah, we nobody can say that we did not fulfill steady state conditions. If the vehicle can go on this blue line here, then uh, then uh, we're not having these inertia forces because inertia forces you gotta use the acceleration you measured and then you gotta filter that and then you gotta times the mass and and that's just one thing. But the other thing is also if you get if you start getting some load shift back and forth, then uh, you're not having the the right loading conditions that you will ever be able to produce in your simulation. It's much easier to do it as steady state. And and putting a putting a we call that a kinematic driver on a vehicle that goes like this in a simulation is, is a piece of cake, no problem. So this is very easy to do in simulation, a little harder to do in real life. So what we did is uh, let's try and build a, a cable uh, driven um, a test setup. And then what we tell the driver is you go up to speed, you go maybe a little more than what I showed here, but you, you go a little bit at the same speed where you try and have zero drawback pull. Um, so then we get a, then we can get a measure of what is the slip at zero drawback pull. So what is the slip that needs to overcome uh, motion resistance in the soil? Um, so, so that's the idea of uh, of keeping it constant, uh, of of going up and then go a little piece with with the same velocity of the two. This is very hard to tell one speedometer, one guy reading a speedometer to go at the same speed as a as what we told the, the cable to go at. So it, it's it's not as easy as I as I as I say. And then we start telling the then we tell the driver now slowly increase your speed with the accelerator. I mean, look at your odometer, which counts track speed or wheel speed, and slowly let that grow like this. And all of us that tried, you can't do it like this, but in MATLAB, it's quite easy. So so, uh, so go up to this until you run out of speed. And that, well, that means you have full throttle and it won't go anymore. We don't want to shift gears and stuff because uh, then you destroy everything. So you, you, you pick the gear that you know the vehicle, the highest gear that you know the vehicle can do this test without bogging down the engine. And on, on one of the test vehicles you saw earlier, we if it was on, on an asphalt, we could actually bog down the engine. But but um, but for the most part, you on a slippery surface, you can you can always pick a low enough gear that you can do this. And the reason why I want you to pick the highest gear possible is because I want to get up to the highest level slip, as you see here. So slip is now on the vertical axis over here to the right. So when you have the highest level slip, um, then we we ensure steady state condition all the way up to that slip. And in this case, it looks like the it was about sixty. Uh, 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 this plot is not matching what it says over here, but it, it's it's a little more than um, you know. It, it it's quite high. The the oh, I'm sorry, the slip here it is sorry. It's the of course sorry. That was the wheel speed. It's the dash line I need to look at here. So that's the slip build up, and. Uh, when I ran out of speed in that one, I'm at 60% slip. I couldn't go anymore. And then what do we do then? Then we tell the controller of the hydraulic winch to slowly decelerate the vehicle at a constant rate. And we picked, I think in the recommendation, we said at 0 0.01 G or 0 0.015 or something like that. Um, uh, so we pick a low enough level that we can, in theory, look away from it, or maybe it's 0 0.0, 0 0.01, I think it was. So we we can we can ignore it or we can at least easily compute it and it at that low g level it, you know it and if you keep that uh, decrease in speed you can just uh, subtract that from the drawbar pool so so that's the ideal uh, uh, setup here so um, so how did we do this so we ended up building a, a machine uh, basically we took a, 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 a it's a forest winch used for removing uh, trees and uh, um, trees in the forest and, and pull them out. I just got to keep track of time. It looks like I'm at 427 already. Uh, so I think I need to hurry up. <laughs> so so, so um, we built this hydraulic winch. We've replaced the, um, 
we replace the the um, the ability to pull forest uh, trees out of the forest to instead reverse it such that you can pull the cable out and then we put a lot of hydraulic valving on this thing with the help of some of these uh, sponsors here uh, some companies here uh, and a lot of students uh, about uh, two uh, uh, four students through this two uh, uh, bachelor students and two uh, master's students and we end up uh, building this system here so the original forest winds was for about four ton capability and we um we put all this um, uh, hydraulic valving and controls from the, this from Danfoss Power Solutions. Their plus one controller is it's a little hard to learn how to use, but once you you have it and can do it, you, it's very efficient. And also a, a, a servo valve from from them as well here to control the the speed. Uh, and the the difficult thing here is the cable you see coming around here. The difficult thing here is that it has a very narrow a drum on it, so the radius that you're rolling up the cable. Um, is varying a lot, so that by you cannot just rotate at a constant speed. You have to actually change that speed. So we had a small encoder. You see up here the white one here that is sitting on the that is sitting on the cable and measuring the cable speed. And we actually also detected this with some um, uh, data acquisition from um, um, the um, uh, some data acquisition system with the GPS to see what the vehicle speed was. But we we use this. Con as the uh, control, as the sensed uh, uh, speed for for uh, for change in the actuation, and uh, so I just want to show some plots here. This is some of the initial work. Uh, I I don't have a, and that's why I haven't submitted a publication to ISTVS on this. We don't have a very fine test done because the only test we actually have done with this was uh, at a demonstration of technology in Trier in, in Germany there last year, and there was a lot of things going on. One of them we had to go on a slope and humpy terrain to be able to uh, fit it well in where the audience was. So it's not a good uh, a test, but 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 those of you that might have been at that test, you did see that we were able to actually run it and keep constant speed no matter what the input is. So that's the trick here, right? The, the, the slip changes and the force changes and you wanna keep that speed constant. So, so uh, um, we were able to do that with this uh, hydraulic uh, setup. Uh, and you see here some variations in speed and a lot of these big uh, spikes you see up here, this is with a uh, set point of four kilometers an hour and these some different settings for the PID controller, but but um, the the big spikes you see here is because the cable sometimes rolls up on itself a little bit and it gives a, a jerk. So that that uh, I would say is a problem we have, but we cannot do that any different with this one here. We we did a lot of testing here at home. That's where this is done uh, before we went to Germany with it. And this is an agricultural research tractor, as you can see. <laughs> the engine is underneath the cap. It's there. Um, we did a lot of testing with this. By the way, they don't like me there anymore because it was a little, uh, it was harder than they normally uh, have done. Um, I have some, um, uh, maybe I can get an indication on this. Should I try and wrap up here in the next uh, a few minutes or so? Uh, because then I think I'll move on to our future work. So I think I'll, I'll just, uh, so uh, I I have a um, three. We're I have okay a, with you, Ollie, as to how you want to uh, carry on. Okay, so I think what I would like to do is uh, uh, run through this because this is our quick demonstration of um, how we use this in an autonomous vehicle setup, and then I really want to show a little bit about where we're going. So I'll run through this uh, quite uh, quick. Uh, it's uh, uh, a demonstration of autonomous uh, capability. Um, there's a virtual environment built, um, and there is a, a vehicle model, and there's a, some autonomous into this, and there's a demonstration of this. Uh, the work was done with two of our master's students, Mass and Sigurd, and um, uh, let me come back here. So we, the, the problem was for autonomous vehicles, it's hard to assess the vehicle in an environment where you don't have, um, uh, you have enough environment to test and there's a lot of edge cases for autonomous systems. So it would be nice if we could do this in simulation. So the idea was here to try and set up with NG and IMM in mind, how would you build a, a virtual environment for, for um, testing autonomous system? Um, so fast and reliable assessment is key here. And it's uh, uh, for us, it has sort of been the, the 
the, the break, what should I say, the initial uh, framework for us to do autonomous uh, vehicles here. So is it feasible to create a real-time capable? So that was the question we had here. We used Unity as the graphics engine, which sufficiently enough uh, accurate dynamics for sensors uh, to assist the assessment of off-road vehicles. So there is a, 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 this case here that's based on uh, a current ongoing um, uh, NATO platform where we had four phases, departure phase, force protection, reconnaissance, and withdrawal phase. Um, and uh, this was uh, built in KRC's test facility also, and they supplied us with the data for this. So I'll go through uh, quickly uh, what it is. So I'll show you uh, the environment, how we build that, the vehicle model, the, what sensors did we use. We have some soft soil. Uh, we had uh, uh, some waypoint drivers uh, because um, uh, we, we needed something to drive the vehicle uh, because there was no uh, autonomy stack uh, available at this point. And then we integrated it with a robotic operating system uh, and tested some different driving models. Um, so I can see it's not uh, shifting here. So, um, so a number of layers is built to, to set up this autonomous uh, framework. Um, the vehicle and then the, the agents, which are uh, external uh, things that can come into play and connect it through this, uh, an AI stack, which is how do we do the control through an uh, autonomous stack. So the layering of the virtual environment consists of all these stuff surfaces, which was measured uh, with the LiDAR from KRC, uh, some infrastructure buildings and other things, some manipulation you might need to do to the area, objects, environment, and some other digital information, which could be a threat, a drone, or something you get from external. So layer one, we, we started with GeoTIFFs, and I don't know if you can look at the map over here. As I flip through, I believe they should change with the, with the virtual environment. So we had some aerial images. Then we had some height maps, which was a triangular irregular network. And then we had some shape files, which were added um, on top of this that said something about uh, where are certain buildings located, where are the road uh, network, and where's the soft soil pit, and other things uh, in there. Layer two is the infrastructure. So that's the overall system boundary we put in. There's some no-go zones, uh, whoopsie, no-go zones. And then there's some physical things we need to model or some digital, which means it's like something that we get through another source that tells us you cannot go there, for instance. Um, then there is uh, the, a virtual environment. There are some uh, the changes that can change. That there are some ch changes that can happen. So temporary manipulation. And I think the, the the main thing is, of course, you can have some operational stuff, vehicles moving in and out. But uh, in terms of um, our community, it's uh, changes in topography. For instance, soft soil. So can you dynamically change the soil as you're going in the simulation environment? Which is a little hard when it's uh, based on a gaming engine. And it can also be friction uh, surfaces. Uh, physical obstruction, so you see here in the map, we, we then, uh, you know, add the buildings, so they come uh, out of the map, and that's based on these shape files we get from the area. And vegetation is based on um, uh, an add-in you can buy to, uh, to uh, Unity uh, for certain types of vegetation. Environment, uh, that can be time of day, uh, different lighting conditions, fog and rain, fog and rain, uh, and other things. Uh, digital Digital information uh, is, is uh, for instance, I didn't mention that before, but it could also be the routes that we plan on going, uh, some specific waypoints, so that's added in as well. Point of interest, areas we have to look at, and so forth. Then you combine all this into a, a, a virtual environment that has a, a vegetation and trees, and they can move in the wind a little bit with these graphics engines. Uh, then the vehicle model, so this is where I want to point out uh, for what we're trying to do here is autonomous, um, uh, trying to test an, an autonomous navigation stack. And one is enough enough. So I'll show you an example here. And remember, it's not because we cannot do vehicle modeling. We do that all the time. But this was to try and stick, stick with the real-time demand needed for testing autonomous autonomy stacks. So with this, we, um, we um, uh, built a vehicle model based on uh, capabilities built into uh, um, uh, Unity and also adding a few extra things. For instance, normally in Unity, you have a collider between a wheel and a terrain by, by this one surface, but then we made three to make sure we captured the width of the tire. 
And there's some spring stiffness of the tire you can include there, and suspension stiffness, and so and so forth. Um, torque curves we can put into the engine. That's that's quite uh, simple. Even a, a, a drivetrain model, you you can put that in based on the test data we had on this Fed Alpha. Um, and also a slip, uh, sort of like Pacheca, like um, the performance on the on the hard surface at least. Um, okay, it's shifting here. Yes, so then the vehicle uh, uh, model itself is this uh, fuel efficiency uh, demonstrator. And we had a lot of detailed information about the CG location and all this. So I just want to give you confidence. We, we, we included that in the mass distribution in this vehicle and as much information about uh, uh, suspension, engine, um, and tires, and so forth. We did some validation. So this is where I want maybe you uh, take away from this is is here's the least an application of NG and IMM. We have a 43D model. It, 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 it might not be the best, but it is a full 3D model. It will account for load transfer and so forth. We do the validation. So those test runs I showed before, we did the so steering uh, wall to wall. We looked at um, uh, constant uh, acceleration. That's this plot here. And braking was maybe not quite so good, but breaks are not for us. We, we just go forward. <laughs> so so areas, of course, you can improve on, but is it necessary for what we're trying to show? Uh, and the answer was no, not with the time we had. Um, so then there's other things, uh, suspension geometry. We look at these vertical step inclines. Can we do those like the tests were done? The uh, V-ditch, uh, the half rounds, and this is the one I particularly want you to see here. So this is a suspension um, half round testing. So we drive across and then we look at the peak acceleration. That's what that test is about, is when do you see um, a two and a half G at the driver's seat? At what speed do you see that? Uh, and I think you should look at it over here when we look at the test results. These are the test results over here. You can see we have some we have some problems. So we are aware of this. And uh, this was the four inch, right? The four inch, that's a, that's that's we're not hitting the speed right at uh, at only a four inch. So it, it's a limitation to our suspension model. We, we're aware of that, but at least we, we document it, and I think that's the point. Um, uh, then there is then there's also um, uh, I was going to see if I had the plot of uh, there's also um, the um, RMS courses. Uh, and we didn't do so well on those either. Uh, I don't know why the plot is not in here, but we we, we can do them, but they're not at, at this uh, accuracy, fidelity needed if it was right quality you're interested in. Uh, but overall motion um, of the vehicle is okay, I believe. Then sensor framework, so we included LiDAR and it's simulated in, uh, so with ray casting, so it's all perfect, I, I, I will say that, and we're, we're working on many things now for including in the NATO group, not me personally. For, for trying to include better sensor models. Um, and uh, so it has reflections also from the material, of course, field of view and, and all this, uh, this stuff. Some issues are when you build models, you end up having maybe a billboard of a, of a tree and then you don't see through where the leaves are. So those are things you need to be aware of. Uh, uh, camera models uh, were included also because we were trying to test some leader follower uh, algorithms here. Uh, then the, we uh, sort of made our own uh, autonomy uh, at this point because we didn't have uh, any stack. So it was a waypoint uh, driver. So you give it some waypoints and then it um, it uh, estimates uh, what what is the speed I should try and go at to be able to, to make it there when you know what the curvature is as you go forward. Um, it, it can also detect uh, obstacles and, and avoid uh, obstacles. And we also had a lead of very early leader follower uh, implementation. Um, then uh, we were able to do formation, so different types of formation. You just uh, ask it uh, to do this. And then um, there's a link here to YouTube, so I'll just leave that on here. I don't think we have time for this now, but this shows how this is running with the uh, Red Bar stack uh, in the system. Um, the ROS integration was based on ROS uh, 1, I believe, and uh, this is how the architecture behind that was. Uh, sensors are publishing data and it goes into the Rust uh, Rust uh, master and then gives back out what should the what should the, the steering controls and so forth be. So 
our point was that we could actually, with the system, evaluate a task. Was it successful? Yes, no. Uh, deviations, you could, you, we could measure did, how close did you get to, uh, to, the, to the tested uh, drive line, maybe, and timing to complete it. Um, identification of objects, we, 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 don't, we didn't do, uh, implement this, so we don't know for sure if this is, uh, uh, we, we didn't have that in there. Um, and then expected response, so this was uh, to when we had some uh, threats, external resets and, and obstacles, did the vehicle go around as we expect. So the, the point was that we, were, we have some metrics, some attempt of giving metrics using a system like this. And this is, has been refined a lot more in the latest uh, three, uh, AVT 341 work in the nature group. Uh, but just showing that a, a demonstration of uh, trying to, to implement this. Um, and we want to keep uh, here, we had uh, real-time performance in this. Now, I want to just wrap up. <laughs> uh, there are some uh, video segments here, and I think you can uh, see them at a, a later time. We, we did some leader follower work uh, also. Uh, I don't want to show, I can show those later. I just want to say the last uh, few uh, things here. Um, uh, so w some of our latest work here now is uh, trying to put the validation effort uh, back into play. So uh, we are uh, working on a, a test bed for smaller vehicles. Um, and we just finished a master's project now with uh, one of the biggest remote control vehicles you can buy. It's actually, you know, the size of my, almost my desk here. Um, and with this, uh, we added uh, um, uh, ultrasonic uh, sensors here. So we look at this as a GPS uh, for indoor use. So right now we can use indoor and outdoor, but we, we made the setup for indoor use. And indoor, hard to get GPS, so we use ultrasonic sensors. Um, it's an off-the-shelf uh, uh, RC car, but we did modify suspension and uh, also uh, the ability to our connection to the vehicle we rode ourselves. My students, this uh, Daniel and Christopher. It has an IMU stereo camera and then a, a wheel hall effect sensor. So and we use this for getting uh, wheel speeds. Uh, we, and then I use the NVIDIA Jetson uh, uh, platform. Um, then uh, we try to do a lot of, uh, uh, as you, you might have seen here, uh, we try to do a lot of uh, tests uh, for this. So road stiffness was uh, uh, measured up here, um, up here, and uh, we made a, a sort of a tire test rig based on a running track. Who, who uses a running track for what they're supposed to be used for anyway? So we we used this, and then we had the vehicle uh, some braking acceleration and and for pitch uh, and roll uh, estimations over here. Um, here are some pictures of our tire tester. Um, it's very hard to uh, to uh, get a test rig on a low budget that's rigid enough. So we struggled a little bit with this, but we are able to get some some shapes of the of the the tire performance. This is a uh, steering measurement we did on uh, characterizing the vehicle for steering. CG measurements here, yaw and roll and pitch inertia in a triangular uh, setup here. Um, and the idea we want to use this is for a, a model predictive control. Um, to come with better control inputs for to get the performance we wanted it. Uh, we also have um, the uses for complex uh, scenarios, so at high uh, li at limit uh, performance of the vehicle. So, uh, uh, and the point was to do optimal path planning, um, for instance, with stochastic data or like mobility maps. Um, it's computationally expensive, it requires careful parameter tweaking but it's a, a good potential here for, for a learning-based method. Um, and we use also a reduced order metal methods to describe a complex dynamics. So it's, it's a tire terrain interaction is, uh, is done through uh, our model, simplified models. Um, we did some indoor experiments with this. Uh, particularly uh, trajectory control. So this is a, a MPC controlled vehicle. So we did some uh, uh, double lane change uh, maneuvers um, and uh, could do the localization with the indoor uh, test setup. And uh, we uh, are here looking at what the steering commands were from the model predictive controller uh, to generate this. Uh, this uh, so the model predictive 
velocity commands are given here, and this is what we got out of the vehicle as we were the blue line is the vehicle uh, as tested. Yes, and I really failed here on the last slide, 60 some students, uh, many, many uh, good colleagues, uh, international through the whole NATO group, and uh, and of course my PhD student, Dario Ciangelo, who, who's working on this right now. Um, uh, so too many uh, to list, but uh, I, I am just a spider in the web, I guess you would call it, and trying to find funding. <laughs> so with this, sorry, I went over a little bit, it uh, looks like, and uh, I hope there's a few questions. Let me see if I can. Uh, Alex was going to pick up the questions. Oh. Yeah, hello. Um, shall I? Uh, shall I start on that one then, George? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, there's a, a, a lot, lot to unpack there, uh, Ollie, and uh, there's there's been one or two questions that come in on the chat. Um, and uh, there's also, I, 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 there may well be some interested parties in the audience who'd even like to uh, uh, to join us at uh, some point. Um, I've got one or two which um, links to one. There, there's, there's one which I can pick up quite quickly. Um, and then I think there's one from Henry Hodges um, who may like to join us on the, on the platform uh, in, in a minute. Um, th th there's one there from Dave White, and it's about. Uh, I just pull back down for a moment. Um, early on, you were talking about soils, and you particularly spent a bit of time on wetlands and uh, peat and modelling peat. Uh, and there's certainly quite a lot of interest in this country because of the amount of peat damage that's been done in agriculture, trying to repair peatland. Uh, and using pluticulture to try and uh, manage peatland with uh, agricultural benefits as well. So I think the question from from Dave White is: Is there or are there any papers on driving agricultural vehicles on rewetted peat? Have you come across anything on that side? Um, I think uh, there, there has been some work uh, with my colleagues there from uh, the agricultural department. Uh, they actually did, uh, uh, and I, I will find the papers on this and, and, and see if I can somehow communicate it out. But they, uh, they did some work. We, we have a lot of, uh, we, we like peat grown potatoes here in Denmark. We, we are so close to Ireland that we have a lot of potatoes here. <laughs> so yeah. so, uh, so, uh, so uh, there's a lot of areas where they take wetlands and they grow uh, potatoes uh, in there. Um, uh, and the way they do it is by draining it so they can drive there. But then at some point, you end up not being able to classify it as peat anymore. So I, I know they did a study um, uh, because when you drain it, then it, it, the organic matter uh, um, it decomposes and it becomes more of an uh, uh, arable soil in, instead. Um, but... Uh, um, uh, so I, I think they did a lot of studies on this, and 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 uh, and I could I could I will do uh, my best at trying to locate uh, uh, some papers on this. All we did uh, was uh, uh, trying to characterize. Uh, actually, the the project we had very early on uh, did include some testing in peat areas uh, also. Uh, but I, there was two things uh, that happened: any money, either money ran out or sensor didn't come in on time, and uh, it, I. Um, so we we don't actually have the the real tests. We did locate the area we were going to test in, but uh, but we don't have those tests. I will say there was a lot of work done, as uh, George Mason mentioned in uh, Estonia uh, in the fall of it must have been 2021 or 2020 in, in August September I guess it was. Um, and I know we have some data from that, and I I do believe that that will will be uh, able to be published. If it if it isn't already, that was a lot of see uh, peat, and in and there's a lot of data on characterizing both lab and as well as in situ testing, yeah. both shear and uh, uh, pressure sinkage and drop tests, all kinds of stuff. Big issue there was it was layered, a lot of layering um, there. Yeah, that 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 seems to be one of one of the interesting things. We I think we have three main types of peat here: blanket, raised, bog, and fen. 
and most of the agricultural um, activity has been on fen in uh, north in East Anglia, which is on a similar latitude probably to mm -hmm. to uh, southern Denmark. Um, but over 150 years, several meters of the peat has actually been worn away. And uh, yeah. as peat contains maybe twice the amount of carbon as, well, 3% of peat uh, across the world contains about twice as much carbon as all the forest in the world. Um, and most of the peat is in northern uh, lands, northern Europe, uh, North America, Siberia, uh, some in equatorial areas then mm. this is going to become a, a particularly serious uh, issue over the next few years. So trying to repair and recover peat um, and using vehicles as part of those operations could actually be rather important. So um, things to do mm. with peat, not just on the agricultural side, but also on the military vehicle side, as the uh, clearly as, yeah. as, as the temperatures rise and more of the tundra areas melt yeah. and most of those are peatlands so some of that peat yeah. work sounds as though it could be really quite interesting yeah i, I know we had another uh, uh, contact uh, 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 but it was another university that got <laughs> the funding but uh, but they were um, uh, look they were trying to harvest uh, biomass in those areas and um, and uh, the, then they, the the question they came with should we have tracks or tires <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, I can't answer that without knowing the soil or the peat, uh, what it is, and and also what your payloads are. What what are you trying to do with it? So I think a lot of people just think that we can hit a button and uh, it's design as usual. But I, I think you really know to need to know a lot about that, that specific local area. And that I, I didn't have time to get into this, but but we're working on on, on low inflation pressure the tires also now, and um, uh, using the tire. Uh, as a vehicle, as a sensor, tire, as a sensor, those are things that are quite interesting to us. Uh, so you can start getting information as you go, because I think, and another thing I meant to show was that we're building a, a mobile bevimeter. Uh, I, I didn't have time for that either, but it's front mounted on a Mercedes Unimar. Uh, the design is finished, now we just got to do the high hardware. Um, uh, that is also to go out and get more data. But again, it's, it's a these things are mon monstrous to go around with. Mm -hmm. So if we can get data as we go, I think it would be very nice. The the the, the fight I get in with uh, geotechnical folks uh, when I use them as, as um, evaluators on some of my projects here locally, at least, is they always talk about, well, it's not confined what you're doing. Uh, and they always want to look at things 10 meters down in the ground. And yeah. I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's up where everything is moving. So it is okay, it's not confined. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, the, the second one here is, uh, I think it's Henry Hodges, and he, he um, he's interested in the issues around subscaling systems from scale models to full scale, which if I can remember was really quite popular several decades ago for quite a lot of work, and uh, I can remember some of the, the, the papers on that. Um, I think Henry is still with us. And just yeah, yes. Henry, would you like to join us, uh, Henry, and, and put yeah. your question to to Ollie? Thanks. If you just click click on the um, the uh, the video and the uh, microphone, you, you're, you, you're welcome you to join me? us if you'd like to. Can Can you hear me now? Can we you can hear, hear you. Now? If you want to click on the on yeah, the video, we will see you as well. Yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't because of uh, our work. I don't. I don't have a functioning camera on my laptop. So. Uh, so, Oli, um, my question is, as you're very well aware, we have struggled um, on the Becker-Wong side of things um, when we look at the bevimeter and when we um, take bevimeter measurements using uh, a much smaller plate uh, than what we're actually evaluating. We've strugg struggled with those coefficients, right? And... Um, so, so trying to upscale some of that has has proven to be you know difficult. If not, just hey, we can't get there um, unless we happen to have John Preston Thomas or Dr. Wong in the field with us. So, my question to you is that as you're chasing down the subscale activity, which obviously is you know potentially a great cost savings as compared to running full vehicles and so on and so forth and you're chasing it down in the autonomous environment, um, what's your sense of how well that 
effort is going to upscale once we um, start dealing with the environment. Um, I think, I think in a in a very controlled environment, you know, a non-deformable surface and and no vegetation hanging around. Uh, okay, I, I can I can understand that that can help with the algorithms, but once we start adding in the va the all the variables, the impact of perspective on the sensors, as well as you know the ability to map those MATLAB relationships or or whatever relationships you're developing from a subscale subscale standpoint, what's your assessment as to whether or not that's going to upscale, you know, to um, to actual vehicles with actual sensor suites, you know, or is there a limit? You know, you you can uh, if you if you've got a subscale model and and uh, you know maybe you can go to a, a three feet height three foot height differential, but not a eight foot height differential. Anyway, I'm just curious as to what your expectations are. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. A very good question. I think I have a my opinion is the easy answer here. I completely agree with you. I don't think we can scale any of this. We just don't have the money, <laughs> right? So to build the full scale systems, but we are learning a ton from these things because as I said uh, earlier also, it depends on what it is we're trying to evaluate. And for us uh, getting into autonomy world, it's a little bit about the uncertainty between the autonomous communication to the, to the actuator driving the vehicle without even worrying about the terrain and all this. So, so getting all these, first things first, weed it out. It's possible to do with, with these small scale systems, but I was not trying to elude, uh, uh, I know I showed our Unity model, uh, uh, which is clearly in ride is no good. Then it's not fair to say that we can, we, we can, we can do perception when we have a poor uh, performance in ride. Um, um, so so uh, the same with the, the small scale vehicles, when it's a complete different animal uh, that what the what the, a larger system would see, uh, I, I think we have to uh, be aware of the limitations, and then we can we can improve things in our simulations that does account for the higher loads and 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 such, and uh, and and see we can validate on the low scale, and then we can maybe predict something on the higher scale. But but of course we need to also work with higher scale. We we we're, we're trying to keep up with the U.S. side, which which have M racers. I think is the highest scale. And we're trying to see if we can get something like the com uh, commercial available things here. So, so that's the next scale. But I even to told Dio, let's use our Unimark since I bought that uh, Mercedes Unimark. And everybody was shaking their head. I'm the only one and a colleague who has a driver's license for that. And he's retiring. So, so just just doing that with us, you know, we can't hire a guy to go out and do all these things, and and just for students to do uh, to to get work done. I think maybe something like uh, ATVs are. Are the limit uh, before we go go big in another type of setting. So, Oli, are you answer. saying are you saying that if you throw enough money at it, you believe it will work, or are you saying no. that you know, no. hey, I haven't thrown enough money at the problem to even know if it will work if it's directly ah, okay, correct. Good, good point. What I meant about money is, uh, let's just build the real the big the big scale systems, and then we we can go do the testing. I didn't mean. I honestly don't think um, if if you have a vehicle that that cannot get into the sub layer, uh, then um, what what good does it make to try and uh, and 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 say that you can talk about sub layering if you have a small autonomous vehicle that that doesn't even touch it? Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I, I do think it's uh, scaling. Uh, scaling in these systems means um, you you have to get into the environment, digging into the environment, the same level as the other vehicle would do. So uh, I, yeah. I think there's a, uh, yeah. And, okay. and what we do with the bevimeter, let me just say uh, the bevimeter we build, we, we base it a lot on the KRC design. And I, I've actually uh, reached out and know who to talk with at your end also. So no, no, uh, no, I can get some feedback there about the sizes of these pressure sinkage plates. Uh, and we pick the same as they have. We have no weight limits. We can go much higher. Um, but um, 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 I, I think we're getting close to uh, not the full size of a contact patch, but we're getting up there where, where I think we might be okay. Thank you. 
Right. Um, OK, thank you. The, I suppose it's slightly linked to that one. It's a, a comment George put in the, the chat earlier on is uh, uh, in uh, earlier. And that is that um, I, if I understand it, a lot of uh, original testing was based on uh, cone uh, index uh, data. Um, have you got any comparative data with the modeling that you're doing now? Um, particularly the field tests with simple, um, for example, cone index data collected in the field at the same time. Is there any 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 work to try and see what the actual improvements in in uh, prediction and, and 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 accuracy are? Yes. So I think uh, we've actually uh, proposed. I wouldn't say I'm the lead on this, but. Um, but we have proposed, there has been work done by uh, 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 Dr. Wong, Carl, um, John Preston Thomas, and Dr. Uh, Jay Akbar on uh, correlating cone index to big long parameters. Um, and I think that, that was a, a success. So there's a, there's a I, I think it's a nice CBS paper on that. Um, uh, but uh, but I think what the problem there is it doesn't uh, it doesn't scale to another soil type or maybe even just another moisture level. Um, so I think we need more data to be able to do these things. I would argue uh, that in the long run, as we can do collect more soil data uh, or in situ testing, maybe with barometers, maybe with tire as a sensor, and correlated with uh, cone index methods like that, uh, could uh, potentially uh, give us give us that ability. And I think the I'm I'm by no way a fan of a barometer, not after trying to build and budget it. Uh, it's it's a huge monster, as I said, uh, uh, but I think it's a necessary evil um, uh, to get uh, to the next uh, to the next level where we can maybe just rely on uh, the tire as a sensor and and uh, cone data. I think also just the tire as a sensor, we we still have a lot of a lot of unknowns in terms of just the tire construction and that what low pressure does that have a you know what what's the influence on this. And the nice thing about a cone is the same thing every time, and, and maybe we have to use a rigid tire, um, but but then the, the the tread influence and all this. So, so so a lot of and I know there's a lot of work done in Germany also and on um, on the draw up all the different tread uh, uh, designs and all this. So so I think my 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 answer again uh, as I maybe was a little naive when I started with NGN IMM that it will be the solution to everything. Us getting more data uh, will be the solution to everything. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but if we at least can start uh, linking vehicle vehicle as a sensor, maybe um, to uh, to uh, to uh, some soil measurements. Now, how do you get cone data if you haven't been there before? I don't know. You, you people do a remote sensing also, so that's another area of uh, of research uh, going into this. So. Well, all that said, if we are trying to propose a, a project within the NATO groups on the remote sensing, cone data, Bergawang data, and draw pull data. So we are trying. We are trying to get at this. Uh, if it's going to fly, I, I don't know. It's 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 a lot of it's a lot of work that's really hard to explain to people that we need money to do, because uh, it's like, well, well, how do I get a mobility map out of that? There's a long ways to get there. So it's about building confidence so you can do it faster in the future. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, Carl Beck has got some comments about the tire modeling. And uh, Carl, would you like to switch on audio and video and, and, and join us to put your question? Hi, yes. Good yeah, hello. Ali and Ke Alex, uh, hope everybody is well. Um, what we've seen with um, the magic tire formula is that in Adams, you're limited to only 8 hertz um, vertical response, basically. So, um, Right comfort, you need higher frequency inputs, so you won't get um, proper uh, right comfort evaluation results if you use a magic type formula. Uh, so what we've seen, or oh, the Adams su su suggests F tire, but F tire also struggles with um, large lug tires, and that's typically what's used on agricultural tires and military vehicles. Uh, these large lugs are a bit of a a black magic <laughs> that's happening so um it does affect affect the ride extremely and um even the larger tires also operates at lower frequencies because they're heavier so all the natural frequencies mm -hmm. are lower 
so you get to wheel up very uh, much sooner than a passenger car tire. Uh, so we're working yes. a lot on on that. But I think um, seeing that you guys need a uh, a driver for the Unimog, I've got a license. <laughs> we can start working together. <laughs> yes, and you have a steering wheel on the right side also. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Alex, I'm sure you can be trained, no problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, just, just to comment on the on the tire, so in, in that ride work, uh, we did, um, so th there is a paper about to come out on that, I believe, uh, from Xiaobo Yang and uh, Austin Akhilin from Turkey and he uh, traveled from Oscars, um, uh, where and we were also doing part of this where we where we ran the Fed Alpha vehicle. We had a very high fidelity uh, model of that built by uh, MSC uh, back then, um, and we all used that and rode it across this hard surface for this 3D ride input. We did play with the uh, some there were some tire parameters, but I, I, it was not F tire. I agree with you on that and. Um, um so so you're you're thinking low pressure uh this could be very important yes um skulk else in his initial um investigations with our land rover that we use um we could find mm -hmm. very good correlation over discrete obstacles as in round bumps okay. or cleats yeah. but as soon as you go up to the belgian paving or any other uh, rougher terrain then correlation is non-existent so uh, the yeah, tire model yeah. definitely plays a very big role if you want to do right comfort evaluations. Yeah, yeah. I think the the the, the big question we were trying to address back then was a little more on um, it was a little bit more on um, on um, on the test course description uh, than on 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 getting the the second digit right in the in the RMS uh, the speed the actual power. Sorry. Um, yeah. I, I will not uh, underestimate that that second digit can be important <laughs> when it comes to. So the, the other problem so as I, well is the um, what you call it um, the way you calculate or you you can get the same uh, right comfort value for a discrete input compared to a random input that's smaller. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. selecting the terrain to use also plays a big role. Yeah. Yeah. So just by driving over one it, bump, you can get a very bad um, right comfort evaluation, but you can drive over a very mm -hmm. rough road and be satisfied with it. So RMS yeah, can yeah. get you around as well. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, the, the RMS was, um, the, the, the reason for all that work was RMS is not enough to describe uh, test course, uh, so yes. you need wavelength information also. Yes. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, we're trying to address that uh, in this, um, but uh, I will, I will, I will, I will say also, uh, um, what, what, if we end up with the FEM tires, almost or F tire at least, uh, um, then uh, it, 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 it might be more a design uh, question uh, than uh, than a testing. Um, uh, like test course description, which is what we're trying to address. Yes. I do agree. Uh, I do completely agree uh, that uh, th th there's a level of fidelity. And my argument in this, uh, and I'm supposed to write a, a guideline on this, uh, also on the on the modeling and simulation fidelity. Um, and one of them is normally what I say to FEM students, right? You 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 throw some more elements in until the result doesn't converge, <laughs> or until the result doesn't change, and then you back off a little bit. And I want to do the same here. I yeah. just say just keep advancing your tire model until your result doesn't change, and then you back off. A little yeah. Bit. What what also helps to evaluate the terrain is using the PSD. Um, yeah. Instead of yeah. RMS. Yeah. 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 Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think. That paper that will come out uh, also includes that, and I think there's a there's a big section on that in the um, uh, in in I think there is a big section on that in the the NATO reports also. But there's more. We've done a lot of work after those reports. Um, so and there's a new uh, three year group led by uh, uh, Mr. Hodges himself on ride quality uh, for exactly uh, having a three D terrain. And 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 my uh, I'm part of, part of that, and and my input in this is also to look at the soft soil, and I see a question, and this also, uh, uh, so so we're looking at the uh, low inflation pressures, and and wh wh what does that, uh, how does that uh, benefit us in this? But I think the other question is, um, 
just on hard surface, uh, what is the model fidelity necessary? Hmm. Um, I think from, from the soft soil perspective, it was more that there is a, uh, some uh, cushion in the soil and that thereby you can go faster in the soft soil. So you, you, maybe we are, we are being too conservative in terms of speed made good in soft soil. It's possible. Yeah. So, so Carl, Carl, it sounds to me like you're you're volunteering for our ABT 380. This is Henry. Yes. <laughs> sounds good. Does there still be some info? Let me have a go. <laughs> so, We've got some really good test facilities down there, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's plenty exactly. Of so David David Reinecke, you know, is uh, is part of that. Um, although he's not always available. But coming back to your point, um, we're referring to the terrain as 3D terrain. Uh, the modeling and simulation, uh, obviously, if the simulation cannot look down to the dimensions of the contact patch, um, including the block tread design, then you're going to lose um, the frequency content of the of the input. And you can get gross motion, but but you lose the frequency content, which then means you lose the phase, which then means that when you're trying to do 3D three-dimensional ride quality analysis, um, you you can't coming, you know, in simulation, coming back to your point. So those are all elements that uh, are hopefully going to be addressed by AVT 380, which will then uh, hopefully re result in a revised stand rec for how better to uh, do uh, ride quality analysis as it impacts operational capability, whether it's commercial or DOD. Um, and and some sort of uh, formalized standard. So uh, so yeah, um, you would be most welcome. Thank you. Cool. So Ali, I think uh, um, it looks like you're still enjoying what you're doing, and keep on doing it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm very impressed with what I see from your end too. And I wish uh, you could invite me down to visit you. My current funding doesn't allow it. But yeah, you've got an op time. open invitation, so you're welcome anytime. Yeah. <laughs> and the weather is good. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, very good. Okay, thanks, Carl, for that. Um, there's one question there, a little bit linked to that uh, um, last sort of bit of uh, a discussion or the one that, that, that Henry was, was, was talking about. Um, and it, it, it's sort of almost going back to the idea of using dimensional analysis, uh, which uh, used to be quite popular, obviously, in previous decades, a lot of work on in, in the process of scaling. Um, and I, I think I can remember examples, of Alan Reese, who, who was uh, one of the teachers in Newcastle, used to use use more than, than 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 one good example have you um actually tried using any i mean i know you're going in a slightly um analytical different direction but have you tried any uh, dimensional analysis to try and look around problems at all i i have not i i shouldn't start saying something because i i have not and i think um the the yeah, the, the only thing was us investigating a little bit on this plate uh, sink it, uh, the plate sink it's the sizes of these plates. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've not done the proper uh, uh, analysis into this. I know I have colleagues here that do a lot of wind, wind, um, uh, you know, uh, floating wind turbines, and they do a lot of scale tests in offshore. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I, I should maybe look into yeah, more. The of this question is using that example uh, as a yeah. For yes, ideas, and, yeah. and I, I think I know there was also, um, well, there's also uh, some other folks in the in the UK uh, looking at this. Um, at um, oh, now I lost it. Also, I, my memory is not too good right now. But uh, but uh, I I really um, I really uh, struggle understanding when when like that you can do this. If for instance we talk about layering, and you get into a different layer that is completely out of range of the so you're seeing something that's a totally different uh, input set so yeah. i i have a little bit of a struggle seeing it when it's so discreet the changes uh but with that said doing these tests with real size vehicles and stuff it's just um it's just a it's just a it's fun and stuff but it's a, a, a logistics and a nightmare uh if you're not set up for doing it as, as some some yeah. of you are of course yeah there was one thing uh, that I, 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 as you were going through that 
sort of caught my attention, and that was the, the virtual environment modeling that you uh, you showed us and the steps yeah. you went through that. And obviously, one of the things which is probably coming to the fore quite a lot now, particularly with, with the attention around climate change and increased uh, wet, severe weather events, is um, disaster relief. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly as one event like flooding may often lead to landslides and 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 uh, other problems where you don't necessarily want to take manned vehicles. So um, unguided, uh, uh, unmanned, guided vehicles um, mm -hmm. to go into areas um, and using the, the sort of modelling that you're using, if it can be done on a fairly quick. Uh, turnaround looks as though it has quite a lot of potential. Is that something that you've looked at at all? Because it, it uh, some of the, the the techniques there look as though they might be very applicable. Yeah. So there's a, so we, we discuss this a lot in the NATO group and uh, and also with my students when they're doing this because uh, I said we have a physical environment at, at uh, in Michigan there, and that's the one you need to model. And they're saying I, we don't want to we don't want to measure up trees and find out where to put them and stuff. So they use this a procedural uh, generation uh, where you just you just sort of outline an area and then you click uh, plant trees, and it does yeah. that in a nat natural way. Uh, so it's not exactly the same, but it's of similar content. Um, one thing we did notice when we were driving around with this uh, autonomous uh, the autonomy stack, you know, it detected the obstacles. So so it detected where the trees were. And we can report that back as long as we can recognize that what it saw was a tree so and there's also work done by um marian robanski in czech republic uh, on um, on uh, you know forest uh, determination by looking at canopies from satellite yeah. uh, data. yes yes i, I remember so, that yeah so i think maybe there's a there's a things we can we can uh, bridge there too now when things change uh, in terms of flooding and you get a complete uh, you know um uh, yeah, uh, 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 flooded. What do you call it? Uh, uh, I'm looking for the English word. Made, made it in Danish, which is a uh, saturated, right? Yes, uh, saturated soil or something. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know the high chains in uh, in characteristics there. Uh, how, how do how do we get that information in? Then uh, can you get that from from satellite? Or so so maybe some of this remote sensing uh, can 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 guide us there. Yeah, I would say uh, I know this is being recorded, but uh, I would say that I am very skeptical uh, at this point of remote uh, sensing without in situ measurements, uh, um, uh, because I. But but it's because I haven't seen the data enough to that I that I that I'm convinced. So so that's why I'm I'm pushing this uh, new effort of remote sensing versus uh, cone versus uh, barometer versus drop up hole to get. Yeah. To get down to uh, to to what what actually works. Um, uh, so so I'm very impressed with remote sensing, and I think it would be great if we if that's the way we can go. But I think you need there's a lot of training of these models um, yeah. that needs to be done. Um, I think some of our, our Japanese colleagues have been looking at this um, over recent years of yeah. using drones to actually go in and take measurements or to take the sensors in to do in situ testing. Okay. So yeah. there yeah. could be quite a lot of potential there. Because um, obviously it, it's safer to uh, to use uh, unmanned machines than it is, yeah. particularly in these sorts of environments, than, yeah. than to, to send people in. Yep, yep. Um, I was just going to see if I could show you our new uh, um, bevermeter. <laughs> so, but but uh, I, uh, yeah, maybe I, I'll have to. Uh, I have a, a, a picture of it here if you, if you want to see, but uh, again, that's definitely not a, a remote uh, sensed unit. Uh, let's just put it that way. Um, so let me just see if I can. Uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's front mounted. It's actually lightweight. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we, uh, the reason why we, we built it was because um, uh, or designed it it's it's because uh, we experienced with the uh, heavyweight via uh, heavyweight uh, bevermeter from Kimono Research Center. The whole thing weighed about two and a half tons. Um, I, I will share screen here in a second. Um, that um, uh, the um, so here we I think I can share screen now. Let me just do it. 
Um, so you maybe you see it here. Uh, so yeah. So uh, so so here's um. Here is the original barometer from Kivana Research Center. Uh, so with everything, uh, including the, so these are the shear rings, uh, rubber soil and soil soil shear rings. And uh, you, you put the weights on here uh, for normal load. So you have to move these around yourself. Um, so with the weights and everything, the, the system weighs about two and a half uh, tons. Um, uh, so it, it, it becomes uh, massive. So what we are trying to, to do is instead use this, uh, um the truck itself as a as a as a counterweight and instead we we have a front lift here and we we we, we put some support bars at the end at the back end of the vehicle and um we uh we then just have a, a double action um a, a front end uh, loader as you a front end uh, the hoist as you see here so we, we can actually load it with up to about um uh, four tons or something, the whole vehicle. So we get way above the, the range we need for this uh, pressure sink. It's uh, a test we do. So the, the, the point of this design was it's about 400 kilos. Uh, so all these beams are, are made out of uh, fiberglass and um, um, uh, through a, a Danish company called Fiberline that produces these uh, sort of construction beams in, in lightweight material. And also we have a scaling system on the loading uh, through a gear ra gearing ratio, a little bit like you in the gym, what you do when you do a uh, lifting in the gym. So we have uh, uh, only a fourth of the weight of the loads for the sharings. Um, we haven't tested this, haven't built or tested this yet, but, but the point was we want to be able to get more data to validate exactly those kinds. So we, we want to make ourselves an interesting partner in projects where we are trying to do remote sensing. Plenty, plenty of scope and lots of uh, little bits of the jigsaw yeah. to try and join up. Uh, uh, here. Yes, and, and so. you, you, you thought, uh, you thought we learned from the hydraulic winds machine to not get into building new gadgets. <laughs> so, so, so uh, uh, there's just something about doing things and having real data, you know, uh, that I'm intrigued by. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we've um, we, 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 we've covered most of the questions that, that have come up, and it's time to, to let you have a rest as well. So uh, I must say um, there's an awful lot to digest and to, to unpack from from what you've you've you've, you've given us today. And uh, one of the good things is we we have a recording which we can put onto YouTube, and hopefully there are there are areas where people will will like to go back and to go through. Uh, uh, some of these things. Uh, I say, uh, for me, I was particularly interested in some of that virtual environment modeling you did. And, yeah. and I'm sure there's another talk there at least um, at yes. some point, because um, uh, yeah. the, 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 there was a lot of, 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 of going on and how that was all put together and so on. So hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, you'll, you'll come back and give us a a part two and possibly part three um, of, of <laughs> sounds, some of this work. Sounds good. Uh, I'll, I'll try and I can see uh, Dr. Giacomo reminding me. It's GV sets, of course, that uh, we that the yeah, conference where we some were of were your students, if they're interested in, in in taking part in the student research seminar, then we, we'd love to have them on, uh, uh, yes, on one of those I, sessions as well. Yes. I was I actually uh, we already talked about that so he's ready would like to do something on his uh, autonomous uh, work leader follower work so yeah so that, that's yeah. good um just very, very quickly to everyone who's still here um there's a lot of information on the ISTVS website about events coming up such as the uh, uh, the Polish conference and the Barcelona uh, World Congress and please please see those um but uh before we finish George, I don't know if George are you still able to join us If you'd yes. like, would you like to sort of um, um, uh, sort of finish us off with uh, 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 some comments, please? Uh, just to, uh, I think obviously Ollie's done a really good job here, and he's put a lot together. So we're very thankful for all the work he's put there. And oh, there was just one thing there, Ollie. There was one uh, one of the um, uh, 
the audience did ask whether you would be able to make some of your presentation available as a PDF, which we can put onto the uh, uh, onto our website, linked to the YouTube. Uh, um, I think yes, there's quite a lot of interest. Yes, I think so, and uh, uh, some of it is uh, maybe in those uh, TV sets papers as well. Um, so I can maybe make a link to uh, to those. Um, yeah, we can we can we can add a PDF to uh, to the, to the website, uh, and yeah, then it, okay. uh, it it'll link through. Yeah. So, great. so I'll I'll hand over to George to to finish us off there. Thanks a lot. Okay, very very quick. Uh, uh, on, on ISTBS, it, we'll, uh, we'll have another one coming up in the next month or two. Alex and I are working on that. Uh, but membership, we're, uh, we need people to renew. We don't have an automatic renewal on ISTBS. So uh, please please renew your membership. And if you uh, see some colleagues, bring them on board. The more people we have, the better. This is a very old society, and it's a relatively small and collective one. The next meeting in Poland, the conference there will be very unique and, and well attended. They have quite a few papers, so it, it'll be a good time to enter, uh, intertwine with people. And and the follow on from that will be in Tokyo, as I understand it, the next year. So there's there's some uh, real opportunities to go to some nice conferences and, and meet up with some people that uh, are very influential in this area. Well, thank you everybody for coming and it's been a great brief and hope to see you again. I guess we're signing off. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.